The Shadow Over Innsmouth by H.P. Lovecraft. During the winter of 1927, officials of the federal government made a strange and secret investigation of certain conditions in the ancient Massachusetts seaport of Innsmouth. The public first learned of it in February, when a vast series of raids and arrests occurred, followed by the deliberate burning and dynamiting, under suitable precautions, of an enormous number of crumbling, worm-eaten and supposedly empty houses along the abandoned waterfront. Uninquiring souls let this occurrence pass as one of the major clashes in a spasmodic war on liquor. Keener news followers, however, wondered at the prodigious number of arrests, the abnormally large force of men used in making them, and the secrecy surrounding the disposal of the prisoners. No trials or even definite charges were reported, nor were any of the captives seen thereafter in the regular jails of the nation. There were vague statements about disease and concentration camps, and later about dispersal in various naval and military prisons, but nothing positive ever developed. Innsmouth itself was left almost depopulated, and is even now only beginning to shew signs of a sluggishly revived existence. Complaints from many liberal organisations were met with long confidential discussions, and representatives were taken on trips to certain camps and prisons. As a result, these societies became surprisingly passive and reticent. Newspaper men were harder to manage, but seemed largely to cooperate with the government in the end. Only one paper, a tabloid always discounted because of its wild policy, mentioned the deep-diving submarine that discharged torpedoes downward in the marine abyss just beyond Devil Reef. That item, gathered by chance in a haunt of sailors, seemed indeed rather far-fetched, since the low black reef lies a full mile and a half out from Innsmouth Harbour. People around the country and in the nearby towns muttered a great deal among themselves, but said very little to the outer world. They had talked about dying and half-deserted Innsmouth for nearly a century, and nothing new could be wilder or more hideous than what they had whispered and hinted years before. Many things had taught them secretiveness, and there was now no need to exert pressure on them. Besides, they really knew very little, for wide salt marshes, desolate and unpeopled, keep neighbours off from Innsmouth on the landward side. But at last, I am going to defy the ban on speech about this thing. Results, I am certain, are so thorough that no public harm save a shock of repulsion could ever accrue from a hinting of what was found by those horrified raiders at Innsmouth. Besides, what was found might possibly have more than one explanation. I do not know just how much of the whole tale has been told even to me, and I have many reasons for not wishing to probe deeper. For my contact with this affair has been closer than that of any other layman, and I have carried away impressions which are yet to drive me to drastic measures. It was I who fled frantically out of Innsmouth in the early morning hours of July 16, 1927, and whose frightened appeals for government inquiry and action brought on the whole reported episode. I was willing enough to stay mute while the affair was fresh and uncertain. But now that it is an old story, with public interest and curiosity gone, I have an odd craving to whisper about those few frightful hours in that ill-rumoured and evilly shadowed seaport of death and blasphemous abnormality. The mere telling helps me to restore confidence in my own faculties, to reassure myself that I was not simply the first to succumb to a contagious nightmare hallucination. It helps me, too, in making up my mind regarding a certain terrible step which lies ahead of me. I never heard of Innsmouth till the day before I saw it for the first, and so far, last time. I was celebrating my coming of age by a tour of New England, sightseeing, antiquarian, and genealogical, and had planned to go directly from ancient Newburyport to Arkham, whence my mother's family was derived. I had no car, but was travelling by train, trolley, and motor coach, always seeking the cheapest possible route. In Newburyport, they told me that the steam train was the thing to take to Arkham, and it was only at the station ticket office, when I demurred at the high fare, that I learned about Innsmouth. The stout, shrewd-faced agent, whose speech shewed him to be no local man, seemed sympathetic toward my efforts at economy, 
and made a suggestion that none of my other informants had offered. You could take that old bus, I suppose, he said with a certain hesitation, but it ain't thought much of hereabouts. It goes through Innsmouth. You may have heard about that, and so the people don't like it. Run by an Innsmouth fellow, Joe Sargent, but never gets any custom from here, or Arkham either, I guess. Wonder it keeps running at all. I suppose it's cheap enough, but I never see more than two or three people in it, nobody but those Innsmouth folks. Leaves the square, front of Hammond's drugstore, at 10 a.m. and 7 p.m. unless they've changed lately. Looks like a terrible rattle trap. I've never been on it. That was the first I ever heard of shadowed Innsmouth. Any reference to a town not shown on common maps or listed in recent guidebooks would have interested me, and the agent's odd manner of illusion roused something like real curiosity. A town able to inspire such dislike in its neighbours, I thought, must be at least rather unusual and worthy of a tourist's attention. If it came before Arkham, I would stop off there, and so I asked the agent to tell me something about it. He was very deliberate, and spoke with an air of feeling slightly superior to what he said. Innsmouth? Well, it's a queer kind of a town down at the mouth of the Manoxit. Used to be almost a city, quite a port before the War of 1812, but all gone to pieces in the last hundred years or so. No railroad now, B and M never went through, and the branch line from Rowley was given up years ago. More empty houses than there are people, I guess, and no business to speak of except fishing and lobstering. Everybody trades mostly here or in Arkham or Ipswich. Once they had quite a few mills, but nothing's left now except one gold refinery running on the leanest kind of part-time. That refinery, though, used to be a big thing. An old man Marsh who owns it must be rich and creasus. Queer old duck, though, and sticks mighty close in his home. He's supposed to have developed some skin disease or deformity late in life that makes him keep out of sight. Grandson of Captain Obed Marsh, who founded the business. His mother seems to have been some kind of foreigner, they say a South Sea Islander, so everybody raised Cain when he married an Ipswich girl fifty years ago. They always do that about Innsmouth people, and folks here and hereabouts always try to cover up any Innsmouth blood they have in them. But Marsh's children and grandchildren look just like anyone else so far as I can see. I've had them pointed out to me here, though come to think of it, the elder children don't seem to be around lately. Never saw the old man. And why is everybody so down on Innsmouth? Well, young fellow, you mustn't take too much stock in what people around here say. They're hard to get started, but once they do get started, they never let up. They've been telling things about Innsmouth, whispering them mostly, for the last hundred years, I guess, and I gather they're more scared than anything else. Some of the stories would make you laugh, about old Captain Marsh driving bargains with the devil and bringing imps out of hell to live in Innsmouth, or about some kind of devil worship and awful sacrifices in some place near the wharves that people stumbled on around 1845 or thereabouts. But I come from Panton, Vermont, and that kind of story don't go down with me. You ought to hear, though, what some of the old-timers tell about the Black Reef off the coast. Devil Reef, they call it. It's well above water a good part of the time, and never much below it, but at that you could hardly call it an island. The story is that there's a whole legion of devils seen sometimes on that reef, sprawled about or darting in and out of some kind of caves near the top. It's a rugged, uneven thing, a good bit over a mile out, and toward the end of shipping days, sailors used to make big detours just to avoid it. That is, sailors that didn't hail from Innsmouth. One of the things they had against old Captain Marsh was that he was supposed to land on it sometimes at night when the tide was right. Maybe he did, for I dare say the rock formation was interesting, and it's just barely possible he was looking for pirate loot and maybe finding it. But there was talk of his dealing with demons there. Fact is, I guess on the whole it was really the captain that gave the bad reputation to the reef, that was before the big epidemic of 1846, when over half the folks in Innsmouth was carried off. They never did quite figure out what the trouble was, but it was probably some foreign kind of disease brought from China or somewhere by the shipping. It surely was bad enough, 
There was riots over it, and all sorts of ghastly doings that I don't believe ever got outside of town, and it left the place in awful shape. Never came back. There can't be more than 300 or 400 people living there now. But the real thing behind the way folks feel is simply race prejudice, and I don't say I'm blaming those that hold it. I hate those Innsmouth folks myself, and I wouldn't care to go to their town. I suppose you know, though I can see you're a Westerner by your talk, what a lot our New England ships used to have to do with queer ports in Africa, Asia, the South Seas, and everywhere else, and what queer kinds of people they sometimes brought back with them. You've probably heard about the Salem man that came home with a Chinese wife, and maybe you know there's still a bunch of Fiji Islanders somewhere around Cape Cod. Well, there must be something like that back of the Innsmouth people. The place always was badly cut off from the rest of the country by marshes and creeks, and we can't be sure about the ins and outs of the matter. But it's pretty clear that old Captain Marsh must have brought home some odd specimens when he had all three of his ships in commission back in the 20s and 30s. There certainly is a strange kind of streak in the Innsmouth folks today. I don't know how to explain it, but it sort of makes you crawl. You'll notice a little in Sergeant if you take his bus. Some of them have queer, narrow heads with flat noses and bulgy, starey eyes that never seem to shut, and their skin ain't quite right. Rough and scabby, and the sides of their necks are all shriveled or creased up. Get bald too, very young. The older fellows look the worst. Fact is, I don't believe I've ever seen a very old chap of that kind. Guess they must die of looking in the glass. Animals hate them. They used to have lots of horse trouble before autos came in. Nobody around here or in Arkham or Ipswich will have anything to do with them, and they act kind of offish themselves when they come to town or when anyone tries to fish on their grounds. Queer how fish are always thick off Innsmouth Harbour when there ain't any anywhere else around. But just try to fish there yourself and see how the folks chase you off. Those people used to come here on the railroad, walking and taking the train at Rowley after the branch was dropped, but now they use that bus. Yes, there's a hotel in Innsmouth called the Gilman House, but I don't believe it can amount to much. I wouldn't advise you to try it. Better stay over here and take the ten o'clock bus tomorrow morning, then you can get an evening bus there for Arkham at eight o'clock. There was a factory inspector who stopped at the Gilman a couple of years ago, and he had a lot of unpleasant hints about the place. Seems they get a queer crowd there, for this fellow heard voices in other rooms, though most of them was empty, that gave him the shivers. It was foreign talk, he thought, but he said the bad thing about it was the kind of voice that sometimes spoke. It sounded so unnatural, slopping-like, he said, that he didn't dare undress and go to sleep. Just waited up and lit out the first thing in the morning. The talk went on most all night. This fellow, Casey, his name was, had a lot to say about how the Innsmouth folks watched him and seemed kind of on guard. He found the marsh refinery a queer place. It's in an old mill on the lower falls of the Manuxit. What he said tallied up with what I'd heard. Books in bad shape and no clear account of any kind of dealings. You know it's always been a kind of mystery where the marshes get the gold they refine. They've never seemed to do much buying in that line, but years ago they shipped out an enormous lot of ingots. Used to be talk of a queer foreign kind of jewellery that the sailors and refinery men sometimes sold on the sly, or that was seen once or twice on some of the marsh women folks. People allowed maybe old Captain Obed traded for it in some heathen port, especially since he was always ordering stacks of glass beads and trinkets, such as seafaring men used to get for native trade. Others thought and still think he'd found an old pirate cache out on Devil Reef. But here's a funny thing. The old captain's been dead these sixty years, and there ain't been a good-sized ship out of the place since the Civil War, but just the same the marshes still keep on buying a few of those native trade things, mostly glass and rubber gewgaws, they tell me. Maybe the Innsmouth folks like them to look at themselves. Gord knows they've gotten to be about as bad as South Sea cannibals and Guinea savages. That plague of forty-six must have taken off the best blood in the place. Anyway, they're a doubtful lot now, and the marshes and the other rich folks are as bad as any. As I told you, there probably ain't more than four hundred people in the whole town, in spite of all the streets they say there are. 
I guess they're what they call white trash down south, lawless and sly and full of secret doings. They get a lot of fish and lobsters and do exporting by truck. Queer how the fish swarm right there and nowhere else. Nobody can ever keep track of these people, and state school officials and census men have a devil of a time. You can bet that prying strangers ain't welcome around Innsmouth. I've heard personally of more than one business or government man that's disappeared there, and there's loose talk of one who went crazy and is out at Danvers now. They must have fixed up some awful scare for that fellow. That's why I wouldn't go at night if I was you. I've never been there and have no wish to go, but I guess a daytime trip couldn't hurt you, even though the people hereabouts will advise you not to make it. If you're just sightseeing and looking for old-time stuff, Innsmouth ought to be quite a place for you. And so I spent part of that evening at the Newburyport Public Library looking up data about Innsmouth. When I had tried to question the natives in the shops, the lunchroom, the garages and the fire station, I had found them even harder to get started than the ticket agent had predicted and realised that I could not spare the time to overcome their first instinctive reticences. They had a kind of obscure suspiciousness as if there were something amiss with anyone too much interested in Innsmouth. At the YMCA, where I was stopping, the clerk merely discouraged my going to such a dismal, decadent place, and the people at the library shewed much the same attitude. Clearly, in the eyes of the educated, Innsmouth was merely an exaggerated case of civic degeneration. The Essex County histories on the library shelves had very little to say, except that the town was founded in 1643, noted for shipbuilding before the Revolution, a seat of great marine prosperity in the early 19th century, and later a minor factory centre using the Manuxet as power. The epidemic and riots of 1846 were very sparsely treated, as if they formed a discredit to the county. References to decline were few, though the significance of the later record was unmistakable. After the Civil War, all industrial life was confined to the Marsh Refining Company, and the marketing of gold ingots formed the only remaining bit of major commerce aside from the eternal fishing. That fishing paid less and less as the price of the commodity fell, and large-scale corporations offered competition, but there was never a dearth of fish around Innsmouth Harbour. Foreigners seldom settled there, and there was some discreetly veiled evidence that a number of Poles and Portuguese who had tried it had been scattered in a peculiarly drastic fashion. Most interesting of all was a glancing reference to the strange jewellery vaguely associated with Innsmouth. It had evidently impressed the whole countryside more than a little, for mention was made of specimens in the Museum of Miskatonic University at Arkham and in the display room of the Newburyport Historical Society. The fragmentary descriptions of these things were bald and prosaic, but they hinted to me an undercurrent of persistent strangeness. Something about them seemed so odd and provocative that I could not put them out of my mind, and despite the relative lateness of the hour I resolved to see the local sample, said to be a large, queerly proportioned thing evidently meant for a tiara, if it could possibly be arranged. The librarian gave me a note of introduction to the curator of the society, a Miss Anna Tilton, who lived nearby, and after a brief explanation that ancient gentlewoman was kind enough to pilot me into the closed building, since the hour was not outrageously late. The collection was a notable one indeed, but in my present mood I had eyes for nothing but the bizarre object which glistened in a corner cupboard under the electric lights. It took no excessive sensitiveness to beauty to make me literally gasp at the strange, unearthly splendour of the alien, opulent fantasy that rested there on a purple velvet cushion. Even now I can hardly describe what I saw, though it was clearly enough a sort of tiara, as the description had said. It was tall in front, and with a very large and curiously irregular periphery, as if designed for a head of almost freakishly elliptical outline. The material seemed to be predominantly gold, though a weird lighter lustrousness hinted at some strange alloy with an equally beautiful and scarcely identifiable metal. Its condition was almost perfect, and one could have spent hours in studying the striking and puzzlingly untraditional designs, some simply geometrical and some plainly marine, 
chased or moulded in high relief on its surface with a craftsmanship of incredible skill and grace. The longer I looked, the more the thing fascinated me. And in this fascination there was a curiously disturbing element hardly to be classified or accounted for. At first I decided that it was the queer, otherworldly quality of the art which made me uneasy. All other art objects I had ever seen either belonged to some known racial or national stream, or else were consciously modernistic defiances of every recognized stream. This tiara was neither. It clearly belonged to some settled technique of infinite maturity and perfection, yet that technique was utterly remote from any, Eastern or Western, ancient or modern, which I had ever heard of or seen exemplified. It was as if the workmanship were that of another planet. However, I soon saw that my uneasiness had a second and perhaps equally potent source residing in the pictorial and mathematical suggestions of the strange designs. The patterns all hinted of remote secrets and unimaginable abysses in time and space, and the monotonously aquatic nature of the reliefs became almost sinister. Among these reliefs were fabulous monsters of abhorrent grotesqueness and malignity, half ichthyic and half batrachian in suggestion, which one could not dissociate from a certain haunting and uncomfortable sense of pseudo-memory, as if they called up some image from deep cells and tissues whose retentive functions are wholly primal and awesomely ancestral. At times I fancied that every contour of these blasphemous fish frogs was overflowing with the ultimate quintessence of unknown and inhuman evil. In odd contrast to the tiara's aspect was its brief and prosy history, as related by Miss Tilton. It had been pawned for a ridiculous sum at a shop in State Street in 1873 by a drunken Innsmouth man shortly afterward killed in a brawl. The society had acquired it directly from the pawnbroker, at once giving it a display worthy of its quality. It was labelled as of probable East Indian or Indo-Chinese provenance, though the attribution was frankly tentative. Miss Tilton, comparing all possible hypotheses regarding its origin and its presence in New England, was inclined to believe that it formed part of some exotic pirate horde discovered by old Captain Obed Marsh. This view was surely not weakened by the insistent offers of purchase at a high price which the Marshes began to make as soon as they knew of its presence, and which they repeated to this day despite the Society's unvarying determination not to sell. As the good lady shooed me out of the building, she made it clear that the pirate theory of the Marsh fortune was a popular one among the intelligent people of the region. Her own attitude towards shadowed Innsmouth, which she had never seen, was one of disgust at a community slipping far down the cultural scale, and she assured me that the rumours of devil worship were partly justified by a peculiar secret cult which had gained force there and engulfed all the orthodox churches. It was called, she said, the Esoteric Order of Dagon, and was undoubtedly a debased, quasi-pagan thing imported from the East a century before, at a time when the Innsmouth fisheries seemed to be going barren. Its persistence among a simple people was quite natural in view of the sudden and permanent return of abundantly fine fishing, and it soon came to be the greatest influence on the town, replacing Freemasonry altogether and taking up headquarters in the old Masonic Hall on New Church Green. All this, to the pious Miss Tilton, formed an excellent reason for shunning the ancient town of decay and desolation, but to me it was merely a fresh incentive. To my architectural and historical anticipations was now added an acute anthropological zeal, and I could scarcely sleep in my small room at the Y as the night wore away. Shortly before ten the next morning, I stood with one small valise in front of Hammond's drugstore in Old Market Square, waiting for the Innsmouth bus. As the hour for its arrival drew near, I noticed a general drift of the loungers to other places up the street or to the ideal lunch across the square. Evidently, the ticket agent had not exaggerated the dislike which local people bore toward Innsmouth and its denizens. In a few moments, a small motor coach of extreme decrepitude and dirty grey colour rattled down State Street, made a turn and drew up at the curb beside me. I felt immediately that it was the right one, 
a guess which the half-illegible sign on the windshield, Arkham Innsmouth Nubes Port, soon verified. There were only three passengers, dark, unkempt men of sullen visage and somewhat youthful cast, and when the vehicle stopped, they clumsily shambled out and began walking up State Street in a silent, almost furtive fashion. The driver also alighted, and I watched him as he went into the drugstore to make some purchase. This, I reflected, must be the Joe Sergeant mentioned by the ticket agent, and even before I noticed any details there spread over me, a wave of spontaneous aversion which could be neither checked nor explained. It suddenly struck me as very natural that the local people should not wish to ride on a bus owned and driven by this man, or to visit any oftener than possible the habitat of such a man and his kinsfolk. When the driver came out of the store, I looked at him more carefully and tried to determine the source of my evil impression. He was a thin, stoop-shouldered man, not much under six feet tall, dressed in shabby blue civilian clothes and wearing a frayed grey golf cap. His age was perhaps thirty-five, but the odd, deep creases in the sides of his neck made him seem older when one did not study his dull, expressionless face. He had a narrow head, bulging, watery blue eyes that seemed never to wink, a flat nose, a receding forehead and chin, and singularly undeveloped ears. His long, thick lip and coarse-pored greyish cheeks seemed almost beardless, except for some sparse yellow hairs that straggled and curled in irregular patches, and in places the surface seemed queerly irregular, as if peeling from some cutaneous disease. His hands were large and heavily veined, and had a very unusual greyish-blue tinge. The fingers were strikingly short in proportion to the rest of the structure, and seemed to have a tendency to curl closely into the huge palm. As he walked toward the bus, I observed his peculiarly shambling gait, and saw that his feet were inordinately immense. The more I studied them, the more I wondered how he could buy any shoes to fit them. A certain greasiness about the fellow increased my dislike. He was evidently given to working or lounging around the fish docks and carried with him much of their characteristic smell. Just what foreign blood was in him, I could not even guess. His oddities certainly did not look Asiatic, Polynesian, Levantine or Negroid, yet I could see why the people found him alien. I myself would have thought of biological degeneration rather than alienage. I was sorry when I saw that there would be no other passengers on the bus. Somehow I did not like the idea of riding alone with this driver, but as leaving time obviously approached, I conquered my qualms and followed the man aboard, extending him a dollar bill and murmuring the single word, Innsmouth. He looked curiously at me for a second as he returned forty cents change without speaking. I took a seat far behind him, but on the same side of the bus, since I wished to watch the shore during the journey. At length the decrepit vehicle started with a jerk and rattled noisily past the old brick buildings of State Street amidst a cloud of vapour from the exhaust. Glancing at the people on the sidewalks, I thought I detected in them a curious wish to avoid looking at the bus, or at least a wish to avoid seeming to look at it. Then we turned to the left into High Street, where the going was smoother, flying by stately old mansions of the early Republic and still older colonial farmhouses, passing the Lower Green and Parker River, and finally emerging into a long, monotonous stretch of open shore country. The day was warm and sunny, but the landscape of sand, sedge grass and stunted shrubbery became more and more desolate as we proceeded. Out the window I could see the blue water and the sandy line of Plum Island and we presently drew very near the beach as our narrow road veered off from the main highway to Rowley and Ipswich. There were no visible houses, and I could tell by the state of the road that traffic was very light hereabouts. The small, weather-worn telephone poles carried only two wires. Now and then we crossed crude wooden bridges over tidal creeks that wound far inland and promoted the general isolation of the region. Once in a while I noticed dead stumps and crumbling foundation walls above the drifting sand and recalled the old tradition quoted in one of the histories I had read that this was once a fertile and thickly settled countryside. 
The change, it was said, came simultaneously with the Innsmouth epidemic of 1846 and was thought by simple folk to have a dark connection with hidden forces of evil. Actually, it was caused by the unwise cutting of woodlands near the shore, which robbed the soil of its best protection and opened the way for waves of wind-blown sand. At last, we lost sight of Plum Island and saw the vast expanse of the open Atlantic on our left. Our narrow course began to climb steeply, and I felt a singular sense of disquiet in looking at the lonely crest ahead where the rutted roadway met the sky. It was as if the bus were about to keep on in its ascent, leaving the sane earth altogether and merging with the unknown arcana of upper air and cryptical sky. The smell of the sea took on ominous implications, and the silent driver's bent, rigid back and narrow head became more and more hateful. As I looked at him, I saw that the back of his head was almost as hairless as his face, having only a few straggling yellow strands upon a grey, scabrous surface. Then we reached the crest and beheld the outspread valley beyond where the Manuxit joins the sea just north of the long line of cliffs that culminate in Kingsport Head and veer off toward Cape Ann. On the far, misty horizon, I could just make out the dizzy profile of the head, topped by the queer, ancient house of which so many legends are told. But for the moment, all my attention was captured by the nearer panorama just below me. I had, I realised, come face to face with rumour-shadowed Innsmouth. It was a town of wide extent and dense construction, yet one with a portentous dearth of visible life. From the tangle of chimney pots, scarcely a wisp of smoke came, and the three tall steeples loomed stark and unpainted against the seaward horizon. One of them was crumbling down at the top, and in that, and another, there were only black, gaping holes where clock dials should have been. The vast huddle of sagging gambrel roofs and peaked gables conveyed with offensive clearness the idea of wormy decay, and as we approached along the now descending road I could see that many roofs had wholly caved in. There were some large square Georgian houses too, with hipped roofs, cupolas and railed widow's walks. These were mostly well back from the water, and one or two seemed to be in moderately sound condition. Stretching inland from among them, I saw the rusted, grass-grown line of the abandoned railway, with leaning telegraph poles now devoid of wires, and the half-obscured lines of the old carriage roads to Rowley and Ipswich. The decay was worse close to the waterfront, though in its very midst I could spy the white belfry of a fairly well-preserved brick structure which looked like a small factory. The harbour, long clogged with sand, was enclosed by an ancient stone breakwater, on which I could begin to discern the minute forms of a few seated fishermen, and at whose end were what looked like the foundations of a bygone lighthouse. A sandy tongue had formed inside this barrier, and upon it I saw a few decrepit cabins, moored dories, and scattered lobster pots. The only deep water seemed to be where the river poured out past the belfried structure and turned southward to join the ocean at the breakwater's end. Here and there the ruins of wharves jutted out from the shore to end in indeterminate rottenness, those farthest south seeming the most decayed. And far out at sea, despite a high tide, I glimpsed a long black line scarcely rising above the water, yet carrying a suggestion of odd, latent malignancy. This, I knew, must be Devil Reef. As I looked, a subtle, curious sense of beckoning seemed superadded to the grim repulsion, and oddly enough, I found this overtone more disturbing than the primary impression. We met no one on the road, but presently began to pass deserted farms in varying stages of ruin. Then I noticed a few inhabited houses with rags stuffed in the broken windows and shells and dead fish lying about the littered yards. Once or twice I saw listless-looking people working in barren gardens or digging clams on the fishy-smelling beach below, and groups of dirty, simian-visaged children playing around weed-grown doorsteps. Somehow these people seemed more disquieting than the dismal buildings, 
for almost everyone had certain peculiarities of face and motions which I instinctively disliked without being able to define or comprehend them. For a second, I thought this typical physique suggested some picture I had seen, perhaps in a book, under circumstances of particular horror or melancholy. But this pseudo-recollection passed very quickly. As the bus reached a lower level, I began to catch the steady note of a waterfall through the unnatural stillness. The leaning, unpainted houses grew thicker, lined both sides of the road, and displayed more urban tendencies than did those we were leaving behind. The panorama ahead had contracted to a street scene, and in spots I could see where a cobblestone pavement and stretches of brick sidewalk had formerly existed. All the houses were apparently deserted, and there were occasional gaps where tumble-down chimneys and cellar walls told of buildings that had collapsed. Pervading everything was the most nauseous, fishy odour imaginable. Soon, cross streets and junctions began to appear, those on the left leading to shoreward realms of unpaved squalor and decay, while those on the right shewed vistas of departed grandeur. So far, I had seen no people in the town, but there now came signs of a sparse habitation, curtained windows here and there, and an occasional battered motor car at the curb. Pavement and sidewalks were increasingly well-defined, and though most of the houses were quite old, wood and brick structures of the early 19th century, they were obviously kept fit for habitation. As an amateur antiquarian, I almost lost my olfactory disgust and my feeling of menace and repulsion amidst this rich, unaltered survival from the past. But I was not to reach my destination without one very strong impression of poignantly disagreeable quality. The bus had come to a sort of open concourse or radial point with churches on two sides and the bedraggled remains of a circular green in the centre, and I was looking at a large pillared hall on the right-hand junction ahead. The structure's once white paint was now grey and peeling, and the black and gold sign on the pediment was so faded that I could only with difficulty make out the words Esoteric Order of Dagon. This, then, was the former Masonic Hall now given over to a degraded cult. As I strained to decipher this inscription, my notice was distracted by the raucous tones of a cracked bell across the street, and I quickly turned to look out the window on my side of the coach. The sound came from a squat-towered stone church of manifestly later date than most of the houses, built in a clumsy Gothic fashion and having a disproportionately high basement with shuttered windows. Though the hands of its clock were missing on the side I glimpsed, I knew that those hoarse strokes were telling the hour of eleven. Then suddenly all thoughts of time were blotted out by an onrushing image of sharp intensity and unaccountable horror which had seized me before I knew what it really was. The door of the church basement was open, revealing a rectangle of blackness inside, and as I looked, a certain object crossed or seemed to cross that dark rectangle, burning into my brain a momentary conception of nightmare, which was all the more maddening because analysis could not shew a single nightmarish quality in it. It was a living object, the first except the driver that I had seen since entering the compact part of the town, and had I been in a steadier mood I would have found nothing whatever of terror in it. Clearly, as I realised a moment later, it was the pastor, clad in some peculiar vestments doubtless introduced since the Order of Dagon had modified the ritual of the local churches. The thing which had probably caught my first subconscious glance and supplied the touch of bizarre horror was the tall tiara he wore, an almost exact duplicate of the one Miss Tilton had shown me the previous evening. This acting on my imagination, had supplied namelessly sinister qualities to the indeterminate face and robed, shambling form beneath it. There was not, I soon decided, any reason why I should have felt that shuddering touch of evil pseudo-memory. Was it not natural that a local mystery cult should adopt among its regimentals a unique type of headdress made familiar to the community in some strange way, perhaps as treasure trove? A very thin sprinkling of repellent-looking youngish people now became visible on the sidewalks, lone individuals and silent knots of two or three. The lower floors of the crumbling houses sometimes harboured small shops with dingy signs, 
and I noticed a parked truck or two as we rattled along. The sound of waterfalls became more and more distinct, and presently I saw a fairly deep river gorge ahead, spanned by a wide, iron-railed highway bridge, beyond which a large square opened out. As we clanked over the bridge, I looked out on both sides and observed some factory buildings on the edge of the grassy bluff or part way down. The water far below was very abundant, and I could see two vigorous sets of falls upstream on my right and at least one downstream on my left. From this point, the noise was quite deafening. Then we rolled into the large semicircular square across the river and drew up on the right-hand side in front of a tall, cupola-crowned building with remnants of yellow paint and with a half-effaced sign proclaiming it to be the Gilman House. I was glad to get out of that bus and at once proceeded to check my valise in the shabby hotel lobby. There was only one person in sight, an elderly man without what I had come to call the Innsmouth look and I decided not to ask him any of the questions which bothered me, remembering that odd things had been noticed in this hotel. Instead, I strolled out on the square, from which the bus had already gone, and studied the scene minutely and appraisingly. One side of the cobblestoned open space was the straight line of the river. The other was a semicircle of slant-roofed brick buildings of about the 1800 period, from which several streets radiated away to the southeast, south, and southwest. Lamps were depressingly few and small, all low powered incandescents, and I was glad that my plans called for departure before dark, even though I knew the moon would be bright. The buildings were all in fair condition, and included perhaps a dozen shops in current operation, of which one was a grocery of the first national chain, others a dismal restaurant, a drug store and a wholesale fish dealer's office, and still another at the eastern extremity of the square near the river, an office of the town's only industry, the Marsh Refining Company. There were perhaps ten people visible, and four or five automobiles and motor trucks stood scattered about. I did not need to be told that this was the civic centre of Innsmouth. Eastward, I could catch blue glimpses of the harbour against which rose the decaying remains of three once beautiful Georgian steeples, and toward the shore on the opposite bank of the river I saw the white belfry surmounting what I took to be the marsh refinery. For some reason or other I chose to make my first inquiries at the chain grocery, whose personnel was not likely to be native to Innsmouth. I found a solitary boy of about seventeen in charge, and was pleased to note the brightness and affability which promised cheerful information. He seemed exceptionally eager to talk, and I soon gathered that he did not like the place, its fishy smell or its furtive people. A word with any outsider was a relief to him. He hailed from Arkham, boarded with a family who came from Ipswich, and went back home whenever he got a moment off. His family did not like him to work in Innsmouth, but the chain had transferred him there, and he did not wish to give up his job. There was, he said, no public library or chamber of commerce in Innsmouth, but I could probably find my way about. The street I had come down was Federal. West of that were the fine old residence streets, Broad, Washington, Lafayette and Adams, and east of it were the Shorewood slums. It was in these slums, along Main Street, that I would find the old Georgian churches, but they were all long abandoned. It would be well not to make oneself too conspicuous in such neighbourhoods, especially north of the river, since the people were sullen and hostile. Some strangers had even disappeared. Certain spots were almost forbidden territory, as he had learned at considerable cost. One must not, for example, linger much around the marsh refinery, or around any of the still-used churches, or around the pillared order of Dagon Hall at New Church Green. Those churches were very odd, all violently disavowed by their respective denominations elsewhere, and apparently using the queerest kind of ceremonials and clerical vestments. Their creeds were heterodox and mysterious, involving hints of certain marvellous transformations leading to bodily immortality of a sort on this earth. The youth's own pastor, Dr. Wallace of Asbury Me Church in Arkham, had gravely urged him not to join any church in Innsmouth. As for the Innsmouth people, the youth hardly knew what to make of them. 
They were as furtive and seldom seen as animals that live in burrows, and one could hardly imagine how they passed the time apart from their desultory fishing. Perhaps, judging from the quantities of bootleg liquor they consumed, they lay for most of the daylight hours in an alcoholic stupor. They seemed sullenly banded together in some sort of fellowship and understanding, despising the world as if they had access to other and preferable spheres of entity. Their appearance, especially those staring, unwinking eyes which one never saw shut, was certainly shocking enough, and their voices were disgusting. It was awful to hear them chanting in their churches at night, and especially during their main festivals or revivals, which fell twice a year on April 30th and October 31st. They were very fond of the water and swam a great deal in both river and harbour. Swimming races out to Devil Reef were very common, and everyone in sight seemed well able to share in this arduous sport. When one came to think of it, it was generally only rather young people who were seen about in public, and of these the oldest were apt to be the most tainted-looking. When exceptions did occur, they were mostly persons with no trace of aberrancy, like the old clerk at the hotel. One honoured what became of the bulk of the older folk, and whether the Innsmouth look were not a strange and insidious disease phenomenon which increased its hold as years advanced. Only a very rare affliction, of course, could bring about such vast and radical anatomical changes in a single individual after maturity, changes involving osseous factors as basic as the shape of the skull, but then even this aspect was no more baffling and unheard of than the visible features of the malady as a whole. It would be hard, the youth implied, to form any real conclusions regarding such a matter, since one never came to know the natives personally, no matter how long one might live in Innsmouth. The youth was certain that many specimens, even worse than the worst visible ones, were kept locked indoors in some places. People sometimes heard the queerest kind of sounds. The tottering waterfront hovels north of the river were reputedly connected by hidden tunnels, being thus a veritable warren of unseen abnormalities. What kind of foreign blood, if any, these beings had, it was impossible to tell. They sometimes kept certain especially repulsive characters out of sight when government agents and others from the outside world came to town. It would be of no use, my informant said, to ask the natives anything about the place. The only one who would talk was a very aged but normal-looking man who lived at the poorhouse on the north rim of the town and spent his time walking about or lounging around the fire station. This hoary character, Zadok Allen, was ninety-six years old and somewhat touched in the head, besides being the town drunkard. He was a strange, furtive creature who constantly looked over his shoulder as if afraid of something and when sober could not be persuaded to talk at all with strangers. He was, however, unable to resist any offer of his favourite poison, and once drunk would furnish the most astonishing fragments of whispered reminiscence. After all, though, little useful data could be gained from him. Since his stories were all insane, incomplete hints of impossible marvels and horrors which could have no source save in his own disordered fancy. Nobody ever believed him, but the natives did not like him to drink and talk with strangers, and it was not always safe to be seen questioning him. It was probably from him that some of the wildest popular whispers and delusions were derived. Several non-native residents had reported monstrous glimpses from time to time, but between old Zadok's tales and the malformed denizens, it was no wonder such illusions were current. None of the non-natives ever stayed out late at night, there being a widespread impression that it was not wise to do so. Besides, the streets were loathsomely dark. As for business, the abundance of fish was certainly almost uncanny, but the natives were taking less and less advantage of it. Moreover, prices were falling and competition was growing. Of course, the town's real business was the refinery, whose commercial office was on the square only a few doors east of where we stood. Old Man Marsh was never seen, but sometimes went to the works in a closed, curtained car. There were all sorts of rumours about how Marsh had come to look. He had once been a great dandy, and people said he still wore the frock-coated finery of the Edwardian age, curiously adapted to certain deformities. 
His sons had formerly conducted the office in the square, but latterly they had been keeping out of sight a good deal and leaving the brunt of affairs to the younger generation. The sons and their sisters had come to look very queer, especially the elder ones, and it was said that their health was failing. One of the Marsh daughters was a repellent, reptilian-looking woman who wore an excess of weird jewellery clearly of the same exotic tradition as that to which the strange tiara belonged. My informant had noticed it many times, and had heard it spoken of as coming from some secret hoard, either of pirates or of demons. The clergymen, or priests, or whatever they were called nowadays, also wore this kind of ornament as a headdress, but one seldom caught glimpses of them. Other specimens the youth had not seen, though many were rumoured to exist around Innsmouth. The marshes, together with the other three gently bred families of the town, the Waits, the Gilmans, and the Elliots, were all very retiring. They lived in immense houses along Washington Street, and several were reputed to harbour in concealment certain living kinsfolk whose personal aspect forbade public view and whose deaths had been reported and recorded. Warning me that many of the street signs were down, the youth drew for my benefit a rough but ample and painstaking sketch map of the town's salient features. After a moment's study, I felt sure that it would be of great help and pocketed it with profuse thanks. Disliking the dinginess of the single restaurant I had seen, I bought a fair supply of cheese crackers and ginger wafers to serve as a lunch later on. My programme, I decided, would be to thread the principal streets, talk with any non-natives I might encounter, and catch the eight o'clock coach for Arkham. The town, I could see, formed a significant and exaggerated example of communal decay, but being no sociologist, I would limit my serious observations to the field of architecture. Thus, I began my systematic though half-bewildered tour of Innsmouth's narrow, shadow-blighted ways. Crossing the bridge and turning toward the roar of the lower falls, I passed close to the marsh refinery, which seemed oddly free from the noise of industry. This building stood on the steep river bluff near a bridge and an open confluence of streets which I took to be the earliest civic centre, displaced after the revolution by the present town square. Recrossing the gorge on the main street bridge, I struck a region of utter desertion which somehow made me shudder. Collapsing huddles of gambrel roofs formed a jagged and fantastic skyline, above which rose the ghoulish decapitated steeple of an ancient church. Some houses along Main Street were tenanted, but most were tightly boarded up. Down unpaved side streets I saw the black, gaping windows of deserted hovels, many of which leaned at perilous and incredible angles through the sinking of part of the foundations. Those windows stared so spectrally that it took courage to turn eastward toward the waterfront. Certainly, the terror of a deserted house swells in geometrical rather than arithmetical progression as houses multiply to form a city of stark desolation. The sight of such endless avenues of fishy-eyed vacancy and death and the thought of such linked infinities of black, brooding compartments given over to cobwebs and memories and the conqueror worm start up vestigial fears and aversions that not even the stoutest philosophy can disperse. Fish Street was as deserted as Maine, though it differed in having many brick-and-stone warehouses still in excellent shape. Water Street was almost its duplicate, save that there were great seaward gaps where wharves had been. Not a living thing did I see, except for the scattered fishermen on the distant breakwater, and not a sound did I hear, save the lapping of the harbour tides and the roar of the falls in the Manuxit. The town was getting more and more on my nerves, and I looked behind me furtively as I picked my way back over the tottering Water Street Bridge. The Fish Street Bridge, according to the sketch, was in ruins. North of the river there were traces of squalid life, active fish-packing houses in Water Street, smoking chimneys and patched roofs here and there, occasional sounds from indeterminate sources and infrequent shambling forms in the dismal streets and unpaved lanes, but I seemed to find this even more oppressive than the southerly desertion. For one thing, the people were more hideous and abnormal than those near the centre of the town, so that I was several times evilly reminded of something utterly fantastic which I could not quite place. 
Undoubtedly, the alien strain in the Innsmouth folk was stronger here than farther inland, unless indeed the Innsmouth look were a disease rather than a blood strain, in which case this district might be held to harbour the more advanced cases. One detail that annoyed me was the distribution of the few faint sounds I heard. They ought naturally to have come wholly from the visibly inhabited houses, yet in reality were often strongest inside the most rigidly boarded up facades. There were creakings, scurryings and hoarse, doubtful noises, and I thought uncomfortably about the hidden tunnels suggested by the grocery boy. Suddenly, I found myself wondering what the voices of those denizens would be like. I had heard no speech so far in this quarter, and was unaccountably anxious not to do so. Pausing only long enough to look at two fine but ruinous old churches at Main and Church Streets, I hastened out of that vile waterfront slum. My next logical goal was New Church Green, but somehow or other I could not bear to repass the church in whose basement I had glimpsed the inexplicably frightening form of that strangely diademed priest or pastor. Besides, the grocery youth had told me that the churches, as well as the order of Dagon Hall, were not advisable neighbourhoods for strangers. Accordingly, I kept north along Main to Martin, then turning inland, crossing Federal Street safely north of the Green, and entering the decayed patrician neighbourhood of Northern Broad, Washington, Lafayette, and Adams Streets. Though these stately old avenues were ill-surfaced and unkempt, their elm-shaded dignity had not entirely departed. Mansion after mansion claimed my gaze, most of them decrepit and boarded up amidst neglected grounds, but one or two in each street shewing signs of occupancy. In Washington Street there was a row of four or five in excellent repair, and with finely tended lawns and gardens. The most sumptuous of these, with wide, terraced parterres extending back the whole way to Lafayette Street, I took to be the home of Old Man Marsh, the afflicted refinery owner. In all these streets no living thing was visible, and I wondered at the complete absence of cats and dogs from Innsmouth. Another thing which puzzled and disturbed me, even in some of the best-preserved mansions, was the tightly shuttered condition of many third-story and attic windows. Furtiveness and secretiveness seemed universal in this hushed city of alienage and death, and I could not escape the sensation of being watched from ambush on every hand by sly, staring eyes that never shut. I shivered as the cracked stroke of three sounded from a belfry on my left, too well did I recall the squat church from which those notes came. Following Washington Street toward the river, I now faced a new zone of former industry and commerce, noting the ruins of a factory ahead and seeing others with the traces of an old railway station and covered railway bridge beyond, up the gorge on my right. The uncertain bridge now before me was posted with a warning sign, but I took the risk and crossed again to the south bank where traces of life reappeared. Furtive, shambling creatures stared cryptically in my direction, and more normal faces eyed me coldly and curiously. Innsmouth was rapidly becoming intolerable, and I turned down Payne Street toward the square in the hope of getting some vehicle to take me to Arkham before the still-distant starting time of that sinister bus. It was then that I saw the tumble-down fire station on my left and noticed the red-faced, bushy-bearded, watery-eyed old man in nondescript rags who sat on a bench in front of it talking with a pair of unkempt but not abnormal-looking firemen. This, of course, must be Zadok Allen, the half-crazed, licorice nonagenarian whose tales of old Innsmouth and its shadow were so hideous and incredible. It must have been some imp of the perverse, or some sardonic pull from dark, hidden sources, which made me change my plans as I did. I had long before resolved to limit my observations to architecture alone, and I was even then hurrying toward the square in an effort to get quick transportation out of this festering city of death and decay. But the sight of old Zadok Allen set up new currents in my mind and made me slacken my pace uncertainly. I had been assured that the old man could do nothing but hint at wild, disjointed and incredible legends, and I had been warned that the natives made it unsafe to be seen talking to him, yet the thought of this aged witness to the town's decay 
with memories going back to the early days of ships and factories, was a lure that no amount of reason could make me resist. After all, the strangest and maddest of myths are often merely symbols or allegories based upon truth, and old Zadok must have seen everything which went on around Innsmouth for the last ninety years. Curiosity flared up beyond sense and caution, and in my youthful egotism I fancied I might be able to sift a nucleus of real history from the confused, extravagant outpouring I would probably extract with the aid of raw whisky. I knew that I could not accost him then and there, for the fireman would surely notice and object. Instead, I reflected, I would prepare by getting some bootleg liquor at a place where the grocery boy had told me it was plentiful. Then I would loaf near the fire station in apparent casualness and fall in with old Zadok after he had started on one of his frequent rambles. The youth said that he was very restless, seldom sitting around the station for more than an hour or two at a time. A quart bottle of whiskey was easily, though not cheaply, obtained in the rear of a dingy variety store just off the square in Elliot Street. The dirty-looking fellow who waited on me had a touch of the staring Innsmouth look, but was quite civil in his way. Being perhaps used to the custom of such convivial strangers, truckmen, gold buyers, and the like, as were occasionally in town. Re-entering the square, I saw that luck was with me for, shuffling out of Payne Street around the corner of the Gilman House, I glimpsed nothing less than the tall, lean, tattered form of old Zadok Allen himself. In accordance with my plan, I attracted his attention by brandishing my newly purchased bottle, and soon realised that he had begun to shuffle wistfully after me as I turned into Waite Street on my way to the most deserted region I could think of. I was steering my course by the map the grocery boy had prepared, and was aiming for the wholly abandoned stretch of southern waterfront which I had previously visited. The only people in sight there had been the fishermen on the distant breakwater, and by going a few squares south I could get beyond the range of these, finding a pair of seats on some abandoned wharf, and being free to question old Zadok unobserved for an indefinite time. Before I reached Main Street I could hear a faint and wheezy, Hey, mister, behind me, and I presently allowed the old man to catch up and take copious pulls from the quart bottle. I began putting out feelers as we walked along to Water Street and turned southward amidst the omnipresent desolation and crazily tilted ruins, but found that the aged tongue did not loosen as quickly as I had expected. At length I saw a grass-grown opening toward the sea between crumbling brick walls with the weedy length of an earth and masonry wharf projecting beyond. Piles of moss-covered stones near the water promised tolerable seats, and the scene was sheltered from all possible view by a ruined warehouse on the north. Here, I thought, was the ideal place for a long, secret colloquy so I guided my companion down the lane and picked out spots to sit in among the mossy stones. The air of death and desertion was ghoulish and the smell of fish almost insufferable, but I was resolved to let nothing deter me. About four hours remained for conversation if I were to catch the eight o'clock coach for Arkham, and I began to dole out more liquor to the ancient tippler, meanwhile eating my own frugal lunch. In my donations, I was careful not to overshoot the mark, for I did not wish Zadok's vinous garrulousness to pass into a stupor. After an hour, his furtive taciturnity shewed signs of disappearing, but much to my disappointment, he still sidetracked my questions about Innsmouth and its shadow-haunted past. He would babble of current topics, revealing a wide acquaintance with newspapers and a great tendency to philosophize in a sententious village fashion. Toward the end of the second hour I feared my quart of whisky would not be enough to produce results, and was wondering whether I had better leave old Zadok and go back for more. Just then, however, chance made the opening which my questions had been unable to make, and the wheezing ancient's rambling took a turn that caused me to lean forward and listen alertly. My back was toward the fishy-smelling sea, but he was facing it and something or other had caused his wandering gaze to light on the low, distant line of Devil Reef, then shewing plainly and almost fascinatingly above the waves. The sight seemed to displease him, 
for he began a series of weak curses which ended in a confidential whisper and a knowing leer. He bent toward me, took hold of my coat lapel, and hissed out some hints that could not be mistaken. Thar's war it all begun. That cursed place of all wickedness wore the deep water start. Gay to hell. Sheer drop down to a bottom no sound in line kintech. Old Cap'n Obed done it. Him that found out morn was good for him in the South Sea Islands. Everybody was in a bad way them days. Trade falling off, mills losing business, even the new ones, and the best of our men folks killed a privateering in the War of 1812 or lost with the Ellesey Brig and the Ranger Snow, both of them Gilman Venters. Obed Marsh, he had three ships afloat, Brigantine Columby, Brig Hetty, and Bark Sumatri Queen. He was the only one as kept on with the East Indian Pacific trade, though Esdras Martin's Barkentine Malay pride made a venter as late as twenty-eight. Never was nobody like Cap Nobed, old limb or Satan. Heh, heh, I kin mind him a-telling about furrin' parts and calling all the folks stupid for going to Christian meetin' and bearing their burdens meek and lowly. Says they'd ought to get better gods like some of the folks in the Inges. Gods as UD bring them good fishing in return for their sacrifices, and UD really answer folks' prayers. Matt Elliot, his fust mate, talked a lot too, only he was aging folks doing any heathen things. Told about an island east of Otaheite where there was a lot of stone ruins older than anybody knew anything about, kinda like them on Ponape in the Carolines, but with carvings of faces that looked like the big statues on Easter Island. There was a little volcanic island near thar too, while there was other ruins with different carvings. Ruins all wore away like they'd been under the sea onked, and with pictures of awful monsters all over them. Well, sir, Matt, he says the natives around there had all the fish they could catch, and sported bracelets and armlets and head rigs made out of a queer kind of gold and covered with pictures of monsters, just like the ones carved over the ruins on the little island. Sort of fish-like frogs or frog-like fishes that was drawed in all kinds of positions, like they was human beings. Nobody could get out of them where they got all the stuff, and all the other natives wondered how they managed to find fish in plenty, even when the very next islands had lean pickings. Matt, he got to wondering too, and so did Cap Nobed. Obed, he notices, besides, that lots of the hands and young folks you d drop out of sight for good from year to year, and that they weren't many old folks around. Also, he thinks some of the folks looks derned queer, even for canakies. It took Obed to get the truth out of them heathen. I don't know how he'd done it, but he begun by trading for the gold-like things they wore. Asked them where they come from, and EF they could get more, and finally wormed the story out of the old chief. Wallachia, they called him. Nobody but Obed U.D. ever a believed the old yellow devil, but the cap and cud read folks like they was books. Heh, heh. Nobody never believes me now when I tell them, and I don't suppose you will, young fella. Though come to look at you, you have kind of got them sharp reading eyes like Obed had. The old man's whisper grew fainter, and I found myself shuddering at the terrible and sincere portentousness of his intonation, even though I knew his tale could be nothing but drunken fantasy. Well, sir, Obed he'd learnt that they's things on this earth as most folks never heard about, and wouldn't believe E.F. they did hear. It seems these Kanakis were sacrificing heaps of their young men and maidens to some kind of god things that lived under the sea, and getting all kinds of favour in return. They met the things on the little islet with the queer ruins, and it seems them awful pictures o' frogfish monsters were supposed to be pictures of these things. Mebby, they was the kind of critters as got all the mermaid stories and sech started. They had all kinds of cities on the sea bottom, and this island was heaved up from thar. Seems there were some of the things alive in the stone buildings when the island come up sudden to the surface. That's how the Kanakis got wind they was down thar. Made sign talk as soon as they got over being skirt, and pieced up a bargain afore long. Them things liked human sacrifices. Had had em ages afore, but lost track of the upper world arter a time. What they'd done to the victims it ain't for me to say, and I guess Obed wa not none too sharp about asking. But it was all right with the heathens, because they'd been having a hard time and was desperate about everything. They give a certain number of young folks to the sea things twicked every year, May Eve and Halloween, 
regular as could be, also give some of the carved knick-knacks they made. What the things agreed to give in return was plenty of fish. They drove them in from all over the sea, and a few gold-like things now and then. Well, as I says, the natives met the things on the little volcanic islet, going there in canoes with the sacrifices, etc., and bringing back any of the gold-like jewels as was coming to them. At first, the things didn't never go on to the main island, but arter a time they come to want to. Seems they hankered arter mixing with the folks and having gents ceremonies on the big days, May Eve and Halloween. You see, they was able to live both in and out of water, what they call amphibians, I guess. The Kanakis told them as how folks from the other islands might want to wipe them out, EF. They got wind of their being there, but they says they don't care much because they could wipe out the whole brood of humans. F they was willing to bother. That is, any as didn't have certain signs sex as was used onxy by the lost old ones, whoever they was. But not wanting to bother, they'd lay low when anybody visited the island. When it come to mating with them toad-looking fishes, the Kanakis kind of balked, but finally they learnt something as put a new face on the matter. Seems that human folks has got a kind of relation to such water beasts that everything alive come out of the water onked and only needs a little change to go back again. Them things told the Kanakis that EF they mix bloods, there'd be children as UD look human at first, but later turn more and more like the things, till finally they'd take to the water and jine the main lot of things down there. And this is the important part, young fella. Them as turned into fish things and went into the water wouldn't never die. Them things never died except they was kilt violent. Well, sir, it seems by the time Obed knowed them islanders, they was all full of fish blood from them deep water things. When they got old and begun to shoo it, they was kept hid until they felt like taking to the water and quitting the place. Some was more teched than others, and some never did change quite enough to take to the water, but mostly they turned out just the way them things said. Them as was born more like the things changed, Arley. But them as was nearly human, sometimes stayed on the island till they was past seventy, though they'd usually go down under for trial trips afore that. Folks as had took to the water generally come back a good deal to visit, so's a man U.D. often be a-talking to his own five times great-grandfather, who'd left the dry land a couple of hundred years or so afore. Everybody got out of the idea dying except in canoe wars with the other islanders, or as sacrifices to the sea gods down below, or from snake bite or plague or sharp galloping ailments or something afore they could take to the water, but simply looked forward to a kind of change that warned a bit horrible arter a while. They thought what they'd got was well with all they'd had to give up, and I guess Obed kind of come to think the same hisself when he chewed over old Wallachia's story a bit. Wallachia, though, was one of the few as hadn't got none of the fish blood, being of a royal line that intermarried with royal lines on other islands. Wallachia, he shewed Obed a lot of rites and incantations as had to do with the sea things, and let him see some of the folks in the village as had changed a lot from human shape. Somehow or other, though, he never would let him see one of the regular things from right out of the water. In the end, he give him a funny kind of thing um a jig made out of lead or something that he said U.D. bring up the fish things from any place in the water war they might be a nest of them. The idea was to drop it down with the right kind of prayers and sec. Wallachia allowed, as the things was scattered all over the world, so's anybody that looked about could find a nest and bring em up EF they was wanted. Matt, he didn't like this business at all and wanted Obed shud keep away from the island. But the captain was sharp for gain, and found he could get them gold-like things so cheap it U.D. pay him to make a specialty of them. Things went on that way for years, and Obed got enough of that gold-like stuff to make him start the refinery in Waite's old run-down fullin mill. He didn't dash sell the pieces like they was, for folks U.D. be all the time asking questions. All the same, his crews U.D. get a piece and dispose of it now and then, even though they were swore to keep quiet and he let his women folks wear some of the pieces as was more human-like than most. Well, come about thirty-eight, when I was seven year old, Obed he found the island people all wiped out between viages. Seems the other islanders had got wind of what was going on and had took matters into their own hands. 
Suppose they must have had, arter all, them old magic signs as the sea thing says was the only things they was afeard of. No telling what any of them canakies will chance to get a holt of when the sea bottom throws up some island with ruins older than the deluge. Pious cusses these was. They didn't leave nothing standing on either the main island or the little volcanic islet, except what parts of the ruins was too big to knock down. In some places there was little stones strewed about, like charms, with something on them like what you call a swastika nowadays. Probably them was the old one's signs. Folks all wiped out, no trace of no gold-like things, and none of the nearby canakies UD breathe a word about the matter. Wouldn't even admit they'd ever been any people on that island. That naturally hit Obed pretty hard, seeing as his normal trade was doing very poor. It hit the whole of Innsmouth, too, because in seafaring days what profited the master of a ship generally profited the crew proportionate. Most of the folks around the town took the hard times kind of sheep-like and resigned, but they was in bad shape because the fishing was petering out and the mills weren't doing none too well. Then's the time Obed he begun a cursing at the folks for being dull sheep and praying to a Christian heaven as didn't help em none. He told em he'd know the folks as prayed to gods that give something ye really need, and says, EF a good bunch of men, UD stand by him. He could maybe get a halt of sartin powers as UD bring plenty of fish and quite a bit of gold. A course them as sarved on the Sumatry Queen and seed the island knowed what he meant, and wa not none too anxious to get close to see things like they'd heard tell on, but them as didn't know what was all about got kind of swayed by what Obed had to say, and begun to ask him what he could do to set em on the way to the faith as UD bring em results. Here the old man faltered, mumbled, and lapsed into a moody and apprehensive silence glancing nervously over his shoulder and then turning back to stare fascinatedly at the distant black reef. When I spoke to him, he did not answer, so I knew I would have to let him finish the bottle. The insane yarn I was hearing interested me profoundly, for I fancied there was contained within it a sort of crude allegory based upon the strangenesses of Innsmouth and elaborated by an imagination at once creative and full of scraps of exotic legend. Not for a moment did I believe that the tale had any really substantial foundation, but nonetheless the account held a hint of genuine terror, if only because it brought in references to strange jewels clearly akin to the malign tiara I had seen at Newburyport. Perhaps the ornaments had, after all, come from some strange island, and possibly the wild stories were lies of the bygone Obed himself rather than of this antique topa. I handed Zadok the bottle, and he drained it to the last drop. It was curious how he could stand so much whiskey, for not even a trace of thickness had come into his high, wheezy voice. He licked the nose of the bottle and slipped it into his pocket, then beginning to nod and whisper softly to himself. I bent close to catch any articulate words he might utter, and thought I saw a sardonic smile behind the stained, bushy whiskers. Yes. He was really forming words, and I could grasp a fair proportion of them. Poor Matt. Matt, he Alice was aging it, tried to line up the folks on his side, and had long talks with the preachers. No use. They run the congregational parson out of town, and the Methodist fella quit. Never did see resolved Babcock, the Baptist parson, Agin, Wrath o' Jehovah. I was a mighty little critter, but I heard what I heard and seen what I seen. Dagon and Ashtoreth, Belial and Beelzebub, Golden Calf and the idols of Canaan and the Philistines, Babylonish abominations, Mene, Mene, Tekel, Uphasin. He stopped again, and from the look in his watery blue eyes, I feared he was close to a stupor after all. But when I gently shook his shoulder, he turned on me with astonishing alertness and snapped out some more obscure phrases. Don't believe me, hey? Heh, 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 then just tell me, young fella, why Captain Obed and twenty-odd other folks used to row out to Devil Reef in the dead of night and chant things so loud you could hear em all over town when the wind was right. Tell me that, hey? And tell me why Obed was Alice dropping heavy things down into the deep water to the side of the reef, while the bottom shoots down like a cliff low and you can sound? Tell me what he'd done with that funny-shaped lead thing I'm a jig as Wallachia give him? Hey, boy. And what did they all howl on May Eve and again the next Halloween? 
and wide the new church parsons, fellas as used to be sailors, wear them queer robes and cover theirselves with them gold-like things Obed brung. Hey? The watery blue eyes were almost savage and maniacal now, and the dirty white beard bristled electrically. Old Zadok probably saw me shrink back, for he had begun to cackle evilly. Hey, 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 beginning to see, hey? Maybe you'd like to abend me in them days, when I seed things at night out to sea from the cupalo top of my house. Oh, I can tell you, little pitchers have big ears, and I want missing nothing of what was gossiped about Capno Bed and the folks out to the reef. Ha, ha, ha. How about the night I took my pa's ship's glass up to the cupalo and seed the reef a bristling thick with shapes that dove off quick soon's the moon riz? Obed and the folks was in a dory, but them shapes dove off the far side into the deep water and never come up. How do you like to be a little shaver alone up in a cupolo a watching shapes as want human shapes? Hey, he, 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 he. The old man was getting hysterical, and I began to shiver with a nameless alarm. He laid a gnarled claw on my shoulder, and it seemed to me that its shaking was not altogether that of mirth. Suppose one night you seed something heavy heaved off an Obed's dory beyond the reef, and then Larn next day a young fellow was missing from home. Hey, did anybody ever see Hyde or Hare or Hiram Gilman again? Did they? And Nick Pierce and Luelli Waite and Adoniram Southwick and Henry Garrison? Hey, ha, 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 ha. Shapes talk in sign language with their hands. Them as had real hands. Well, sir, that was the time Obed begun to get on his feet again. Folks see his three darters are wearing gold-like things as nobody'd never see on them afore, and smoke started coming out of the refinery chimbley. Other folks were prospering too. Fish begun to swarm into the harbour fit to kill, and heaven knows what size cargoes we begun to ship out to Newburyport, Arkham and Boston. Twas then Obed got the old branch railroad put through. Some Kingsport fishermen heard about the catch and come up in sloops, but they was all lost. Nobody never see him again. And just then our folks organised the esoteric order of Dagon and bought Masonic Hall off in Calvary Commandery for it. Ha, ha, ha. Matt Elliot was a mason, an egg in the selling, but he dropped out of sight just then. Remember, I ain't saying Obed was set on heaven things just like they was on that canarchy isle. I don't think he aimed at fuss to do no mixing, nor raise no young uns to take to the water and turn into fishes with eternal life. He wanted them gold things and was willing to pay heavy, and I guess the others were satisfied for a while. Come in 46, the town done some looking and thinking for itself. Too many folks missing, too much wild preaching at meeting of a Sunday, too much talk about that reef. I guess I'd done a bit by telling Selectman Maori what I see from the cupolo. There was a party one night as followed Obed's crowd out to the reef, and I heard shots betwixt the dories. Next day, Obed and thirty-two others was in jail, with everybody a wondering just what was afoot and just what charge agin em could be got to halt. God, EF, anybody'd looked ahead. A couple of weeks later, when nothing had been thrown into the sea for that long. Zadok was shewing signs of fright and exhaustion, and I let him keep silence for a while, though glancing apprehensively at my watch. The tide had turned and was coming in now, and the sound of the waves seemed to arouse him. I was glad of that tide, for at high water the fishy smell might not be so bad. Again I strained to catch his whispers. That awful night. I seed em. I was up in the cupalo, hordes of em, swarms of em, all over the reef and swimming up the harbour into the Manuxit. God, what happened in the streets of Innsmouth that night? They rattled our door, but P.A. wouldn't open. Then he'd clum out the kitchen window with his musket to find Selectman Maori and see what he could do. Mounds of the dead and the dying. Shots and screams. Shouting in old square and town square and new church green. Jail throwed open. Proclamation. Treason. Called it the plague when folks come in and found half our people missing. Nobody left but them as you dejine in with Obed and them things or else keep quiet. Never heard of my P.A. no more. The old man was panting and perspiring profusely. His grip on my shoulder tightened. Everything cleaned up in the morning, but they was traces. 
Obed, he kinda takes charge and says things is going to be changed. Others all worship with us at meeting time, and certain houses Hez got to entertain guests. They wanted to mix like they'd done with the Kanakis, and he for one didn't feel bound to stop them. Far gone was Obed, just like a crazy man on the subject. He says they brung us fish and treasure and shud have what they hankered arter. Nothing was to be different on the outside, only we was to keep shy of strangers, EF. We knowed what was good for us. We all had to take the oath of Dagon, and later on they were second and third oaths that some on us took. Them as UD help special, UD get special rewards, gold and sec. No use balking, for they was millions of them down there. They'd rather not start rising and wiping out humankind, but EF they was gave away and forced to. They could do a lot toward just that. We didn't have them old charms to cut them off like folks in the South Sea did, and them Kanakis wouldn't never give away their secrets. Yield up enough sacrifices and savage knickknacks and harborage in the town when they wanted it, and they'd let well enough alone. Wouldn't bother no strangers as might bear tales outside. That is, without they got prying. All in the band of the faithful, order O'Dagon, and the children should never die, but go back to the mother Hydra and father Dagon, what we all come from, onct, ee, ee, Cthulhu Ftagen, Fangluim Glunaf, Cthulhu Rilje, Wugar Nagel Ftagen. Old Zadok was fast lapsing into stark raving, and I held my breath. Poor old soul, to what pitiful depths of hallucination had his liquor, plus his hatred of the decay, alienage, and disease around him brought that fertile, imaginative brain. He began to moan now, and tears were coursing down his channeled cheeks into the depths of his beard. God, what I seen sent I was fifteen year old. Mina, Mina, Tekel, Uparson. The folks as was missing, and them as kilt theirselves. Them as told things in Arkham or Ipswich or such places was all called crazy, like you're a-calling me right now. But God, what I seen. They'd a-kilt me long ago for what I know. Only I took the fust and second oaths of Dagon off an Obed, so was protected and lessen a jury of them proved I told things knowing and deliberate. But I wouldn't take the third oath. I'd a died, Ruth, and take that. It got wuss around civil war time, when children born Sanct 46 begun to grow up. Some of them, that is. I was afeard. Never did no prying arter that awful night, and never see one of them closs to in all my life. That is, never no full-blooded one. I went to the war, and EF I'd a had any guts or sense I'd a never come back, but settled away from here. But folks wrote me things weren't so bad. That, I suppose, was because government draft men was in town after 63. After the war, it was just as bad again. People began to fall off. Mills and shops shut down. Shipping stopped and the harbour choked up. Railroad give up. But they, they never stopped swimming in and out of the river from that cursed reef of Satan. And more and more attic windows got a boarded up. And more and more noises was heard in houses as once supposed to have nobody in them. Folks outside have their stories about us. Suppose you've heard a plenty on them, seen what questions ye asked. Stories about things they've seen now and then, and about that queer jewellery as still comes in from somewheres and ain't quite all melted up. But nothing never gets deaf night. Nobody'll believe nothing. They call them gold-like things pirate loot, and all how the Innsmouth folks has fur and blood or is distempered or something. Besides, them that lives here shoo off as many strangers as they kin and encourage the rest not to get very curious, especially Rayown night time. Beasts balk at the critters, hosses, wuss and mules, but when they got autos, that was all right. In 46, Cap and Obed took a second wife that nobody in the town never see, some says he didn't want to, but was made to by them as he'd called in, had three children by her, two as disappeared young, but one gal as looked like anybody else and was educated in Europe. Obed finally got her married off by a trick to an Arkham fella as didn't suspect nothing. But nobody outside lived nothing to do with Innsmouth folks now. Barnabas Marsh that runs the refinery now is Obed's grandson by his fust wife, son of Onesiphorus, his eldest son, but his mother was another o' them as want never seed outdoors. 
Right now, Barnabas is about changed. Can't shed his eyes no more, and is all out of shape. They say he still wears clothes, but he'll take to the water soon. Maybe he's tried it already. They do sometimes go down for little spells afore they go for good. Ain't been seed about in public for nigh on ten year. Don't know how his poor wife kin feel. She come from Ipswich, and they nigh lynched Barnabas when he courted her fifty odd year ago. Obed, he died in seventy eight, and all the next generation is gone now. The fust wife's children dead, and the rest. God knows. The sound of the incoming tide was now very insistent, and little by little it seemed to change the old man's mood from maudlin tearfulness to watchful fear. He would pause now and then to renew those nervous glances over his shoulder or out toward the reef, and despite the wild absurdity of his tale, I could not help beginning to share his vague apprehensiveness. Zadok now grew shriller and seemed to be trying to whip up his courage with louder speech. Hey, you, why don't you say something? How'd you like to be living in a town like this, with everything a-rotten and a-dying, and boarded up monsters crawling and bleating and barking and hopping around black cellars and attics every way you turn? Hey, how'd you like to hear the howling night after night from the churches and order a Dagon Hall and know what's doing part of the howling? How do you like to hear what comes from that awful reef every May Eve and Hallowmas? Hey, think the old man's crazy, eh? Well, sir, let me tell you that ain't the worst. Zadok was really screaming now, and the mad frenzy of his voice disturbed me more than I care to own. Curse ye, don't set there a staring at me with them eyes. I tell Obed Marsh he's in hell, and he's got to stay there. Hey, ha, in hell, I says. Can't get me. I ain't done nothing nor told nobody nothing. Oh, you young fella. Well, even if I ain't told nobody nothing yet, I'm a going to now. You just set still and listen to me, boy. This is what I ain't never told nobody. I says I didn't do no prying arter that night, but I found things out just the same. You want to know what the real horror is, hey? Well, it's this. It ain't what them fish devils has done. But what they're a-going to do, they're a-bringing things up out of war they come from into the town, been doing it for years and slackening up lately. Them houses north of the river betwixt water and main streets is full of them, them devils and what they brung, and when they get ready, I say, when they get ready, ever hear tell of a shoggoth. Hey, do you hear me? I tell you, I know what them things be. I seen them one night when, H, ah, uh, ah, uh, hey, ah. Uh. The hideous suddenness and inhuman frightfulness of the old man's shriek almost made me faint. His eyes, looking past me toward the malodorous sea, were positively starting from his head, while his face was a mask of fear worthy of Greek tragedy. His bony claw dug monstrously into my shoulder, and he made no motion as I turned my head to look at whatever he had glimpsed. There was nothing that I could see, only the incoming tide with perhaps one set of ripples more local than the long-flung line of breakers. But now Zadok was shaking me, and I turned back to watch the melting of that fear-frozen face into a chaos of twitching eyelids and mumbling gums. Presently his voice came back, albeit as a trembling whisper. Get out of here! Get out of here! They seen us? Get out for your life! Don't wait for nothing! They know now! Run for it! Quick, out of this town! Another heavy wave dashed against the loosening masonry of the bygone wharf and changed the mad ancient's whisper to another inhuman and blood-curdling scream. Uh, yeah! Yeah! Before I could recover my scattered wits, he had relaxed his clutch on my shoulder and dashed wildly inland toward the street, reeling northward around the ruined warehouse wall. I glanced back at the sea but there was nothing there. And when I reached Water Street and looked along it toward the north, there was no remaining trace of Zadok Allen. I can hardly describe the mood in which I was left by this harrowing episode, an episode at once mad and pitiful, grotesque and terrifying. The grocery boy had prepared me for it, yet the reality left me nonetheless bewildered and disturbed. 
Puerile though the story was, old Zadok's insane earnestness and horror had communicated to me a mounting unrest which joined with my earlier sense of loathing for the town and its blight of intangible shadow. Later, I might sift the tale and extract some nucleus of historic allegory. Just now I wished to put it out of my head. The hour had grown perilously late. My watch said 7.15, and the Arkham bus left town square at 8, so I tried to give my thoughts as neutral and practical a cast as possible, meanwhile walking rapidly through the deserted streets of gaping roofs and leaning houses toward the hotel where I had checked my valise and would find my bus. Though the golden light of late afternoon gave the ancient roofs and decrepit chimneys an air of mystic loveliness and peace, I could not help glancing over my shoulder now and then. I would surely be very glad to get out of maladrous and fear-shadowed Innsmouth and wish there were some other vehicle than the bus driven by that sinister-looking fellow sergeant. Yet I did not hurry too precipitately, for there were architectural details worth viewing at every silent corner, and I could easily, I calculated, cover the necessary distance in a half hour. Studying the grocery youth's map and seeking a route I had not traversed before, I chose Marsh Street instead of State for my approach to Town Square. Near the corner of Fall Street I began to see scattered groups of furtive whisperers, and when I finally reached the square I saw that almost all the loiterers were congregated around the door of the Gilman House. It seemed as if many bulging, watery, unwinking eyes looked oddly at me as I claimed my valise in the lobby, and I hoped that none of these unpleasant creatures would be my fellow passengers on the coach. The bus, rather early, rattled in with three passengers somewhat before eight, and an evil-looking fellow on the sidewalk muttered a few indistinguishable words to the driver. Sergeant threw out a mailbag and a roll of newspapers and entered the hotel. While the passengers, the same men whom I had seen arriving in Newburyport that morning, shambled to the sidewalk and exchanged some faint, guttural words with a loafer in a language I could have sworn was not English. I boarded the empty coach and took the same seat I had taken before, but was hardly settled before Sergeant reappeared and began mumbling in a throaty voice of peculiar repulsiveness. I was, it appeared, in very bad luck. There had been something wrong with the engine, despite the excellent time made from Newburyport, and the bus could not complete the journey to Arkham. No, it could not possibly be repaired that night, nor was there any other way of getting transportation out of Innsmouth, either to Arkham or elsewhere. Sergeant was sorry, but I would have to stop over at the Gilman. Probably the clerk would make the price easy for me, but there was nothing else to do. Almost dazed by this sudden obstacle, and violently dreading the fall of night in this decaying and half-unlighted town, I left the bus and re-entered the hotel lobby where the sullen, queer-looking night clerk told me I could have room 428 on next the top floor, large, but without running water, for a dollar. Despite what I had heard of this hotel in Newburyport, I signed the register, paid my dollar, let the clerk take my valise, and followed that sour, solitary attendant up three creaking flights of stairs past dusty corridors which seemed wholly devoid of life. My room, a dismal rear one with two windows and bare, cheap furnishings, overlooked a dingy courtyard otherwise hemmed in by low, deserted brick blocks and commanded a view of decrepit westward-stretching roofs with a marshy countryside beyond. At the end of the corridor was a bathroom, a discouraging relique with ancient marble bowl, tin tub, faint electric light and musty wooden panelling around all the plumbing fixtures. It being still daylight, I descended to the square and looked around for a dinner of some sort, noticing as I did so the strange glances I received from the unwholesome loafers. Since the grocery was closed, I was forced to patronise the restaurant I had shunned before, a stooped, narrow-headed man with staring, unwinking eyes and a flat-nosed wench with unbelievably thick, clumsy hands being in attendance. The service was of the counter type, and it relieved me to find that much was evidently served from cans and packages. A bowl of vegetable soup with crackers was enough for me, and I soon headed back for my cheerless room at the Gilman, getting an evening paper and a fly-specked magazine from the evil-visaged clerk at the rickety stand beside his desk. 
As twilight deepened, I turned on the one feeble electric bulb over the cheap, iron-framed bed and tried as best I could to continue the reading I had begun. I felt it advisable to keep my mind wholesomely occupied, for it would not do to brood over the abnormalities of this ancient, blight-shadowed town while I was still within its borders. The insane yarn I had heard from the aged drunkard did not promise very pleasant dreams, and I felt I must keep the image of his wild, watery eyes as far as possible from my imagination. Also, I must not dwell on what that factory inspector had told the Newburyport ticket agent about the Gilman house and the voices of its nocturnal tenants. Not on that, nor on the face beneath the tiara in the black church doorway, the face for whose horror my conscious mind could not account. It would perhaps have been easier to keep my thoughts from disturbing topics had the room not been so gruesomely musty. As it was, the lethal mustiness blended hideously with the town's general fishy odour and persistently focused one's fancy on death and decay. Another thing that disturbed me was the absence of a bolt on the door of my room. One had been there, as marks clearly shewed, but there were signs of recent removal. No doubt it had become out of order, like so many other things in this decrepit edifice. In my nervousness, I looked around and discovered a bolt on the clothes press which seemed to be of the same size, judging from the marks, as the one formerly on the door. To gain a partial relief from the general tension, I busied myself by transferring this hardware to the vacant place with the aid of a handy three-in-one device, including a screwdriver which I kept on my key ring. The bolt fitted perfectly and I was somewhat relieved when I knew that I could shoot it firmly upon retiring. Not that I had any real apprehension of its need, but that any symbol of security was welcome in an environment of this kind. There were adequate bolts on the two lateral doors to connecting rooms, and these I proceeded to fasten. I did not undress, but decided to read till I was sleepy, and then lie down with only my coat, collar, and shoes off. Taking a pocket flashlight from my valise, I placed it in my trousers so that I could read my watch if I woke up later in the dark. Drowsiness, however, did not come, and when I stopped to analyse my thoughts, I found to my disquiet that I was really unconsciously listening for something, listening for something which I dreaded but could not name. That inspector's story must have worked on my imagination more deeply than I had suspected. Again, I tried to read, but found that I made no progress. After a time I seemed to hear the stairs and corridors creak at intervals as if with footsteps and wondered if the other rooms were beginning to fill up. There were no voices, however, and it struck me that there was something subtly furtive about the creaking. I did not like it and debated whether I had better try to sleep at all. This town had some queer people and there had undoubtedly been several disappearances. Was this one of those inns where travellers were slain for their money? Surely I had no look of excessive prosperity, or were the townsfolk really so resentful about curious visitors? Had my obvious sightseeing, with its frequent map consultations, aroused unfavourable notice? It occurred to me that I must be in a highly nervous state to let a few random creakings set me off speculating in this fashion, but I regretted none the less that I was unarmed. At length, feeling a fatigue which had nothing of drowsiness in it, I bolted the newly outfitted hall door, turned off the light, and threw myself down on the hard, uneven bed, coat, collar, shoes, and all. In the darkness, every faint noise of the night seemed magnified, and a flood of doubly unpleasant thoughts swept over me. I was sorry I had put out the light, yet was too tired to rise and turn it on again. Then, after a long, dreary interval, and prefaced by a fresh creaking of stairs and corridor, there came that soft, damnably unmistakable sound which seemed like a malign fulfilment of all my apprehensions. Without the least shadow of a doubt, the lock on my hall door was being tried, cautiously, furtively, tentatively, with a key. My sensations upon recognising this sign of actual peril were perhaps less rather than more tumultuous because of my previous vague fears. I had been, albeit without definite reason, instinctively on my guard, and that was to my advantage in the new and real crisis, whatever it might turn out to be. 
Nevertheless, the change in the menace from vague premonition to immediate reality was a profound shock and fell upon me with the force of a genuine blow. It never once occurred to me that the fumbling might be a mere mistake. Malign purpose was all I could think of, and I kept deathly quiet, awaiting the would-be intruder's next move. After a time, the cautious rattling ceased, and I heard the room to the north entered with a passkey. Then the lock of the connecting door to my room was softly tried. The bolt held, of course, and I heard the floor creak as the prowler left the room. After a moment, there came another soft rattling, and I knew that the room to the south of me was being entered. Again a furtive trying of a bolted connecting door, and again a receding creaking. This time the creaking went along the hall and down the stairs, so I knew that the prowler had realised the bolted condition of my doors and was giving up his attempt for a greater or lesser time, as the future would shew. The readiness with which I fell into a plan of action proves that I must have been subconsciously fearing some menace and considering possible avenues of escape for hours. From the first, I felt that the unseen fumbler meant a danger not to be met or dealt with, but only to be fled from as precipitately as possible. The one thing to do was to get out of that hotel alive as quickly as I could, and through some channel other than the front stairs and lobby. Rising softly and throwing my flashlight on the switch, I sought to light the bulb over my bed in order to choose and pocket some belongings for a swift, valiceless flight. Nothing, however, happened, and I saw that the power had been cut off. Clearly, some cryptic, evil movement was afoot on a large scale, just what I could not say. As I stood pondering with my hand on the now useless switch, I heard a muffled creaking on the floor below and thought I could barely distinguish voices in conversation. A moment later, I felt less sure that the deeper sounds were voices, since the apparent hoarse barkings and loose-syllabled croakings bore so little resemblance to recognised human speech. Then I thought with renewed force of what the factory inspector had heard in the night in this mouldering and pestilential building. Having filled my pockets with the flashlight's aid, I put on my hat and tiptoed to the windows to consider chances of descent. Despite the state safety regulations, there was no fire escape on this side of the hotel, and I saw that my windows commanded only a sheer three-storey drop to the cobbled courtyard. On the right and left, however, some ancient brick business blocks abutted on the hotel, their slant roofs coming up to a reasonable jumping distance from my fourth-storey level. To reach either of these lines of buildings, I would have to be in a room two doors from my own in one case on the north and in the other case on the south, and my mind instantly set to work, calculating what chances I had of making the transfer. I could not, I decided, risk an emergence into the corridor, where my footsteps would surely be heard, and where the difficulties of entering the desired room would be insuperable. My progress, if it was to be made at all, would have to be through the less solidly built connecting doors of the rooms, the locks and bolts of which I would have to force violently, using my shoulder as a battering ram whenever they were set against me. This, I thought, would be possible owing to the rickety nature of the house and its fixtures, but I realised I could not do it noiselessly. I would have to count on sheer speed, and the chance of getting to a window before any hostile forces became coordinated enough to open the right door toward me with a pass key. My own outer door I reinforced by pushing the bureau against it, little by little, in order to make a minimum of sound. I perceived that my chances were very slender, and was fully prepared for any calamity. Even getting to another roof would not solve the problem, for there would then remain the task of reaching the ground and escaping from the town. One thing in my favour was the deserted and ruinous state of the abutting buildings, and the number of skylights gaping blackly open in each row. Gathering from the grocery boy's map that the best route out of town was southward, I glanced first at the connecting door on the south side of the room. It was designed to open in my direction, hence I saw, after drawing the bolt and finding other fastenings in place, it was not a favourable one for forcing. Accordingly abandoning it as a route, 
I cautiously moved the bedstead against it to hamper any attack which might be made on it later from the next room. The door on the north was hung to open away from me, and this, though a test proved it to be locked or bolted from the other side, I knew must be my route. If I could gain the roofs of the buildings in Payne Street and descend successfully to the ground level, I might perhaps dart through the courtyard and the adjacent or opposite buildings to Washington or Bates, or else emerge in Payne and edge around southward into Washington. In any case, I would aim to strike Washington somehow and get quickly out of the town square region. My preference would be to avoid Payne, since the fire station there might be open all night. As I thought of these things, I looked out over the squalid sea of decaying roofs below me, now brightened by the beams of a moon not much past full. On the right, the black gash of the river gorge clove the panorama, abandoned factories and railway station clinging barnacle-like to its sides. Beyond it, the rusted railway and the Rowley Road led off through a flat, marshy terrain dotted with islets of higher and drier scrub-grown land. On the left, the creek-threaded countryside was nearer, the narrow road to Ipswich gleaming white in the moonlight. I could not see from my side of the hotel the southward route toward Arkham, which I had determined to take. I was irresolutely speculating on when I had better attack the northward door and on how I could least audibly manage it, when I noticed that the vague noises underfoot had given place to a fresh and heavier creaking of the stairs. A wavering flicker of light shewed through my transom, and the boards of the corridor began to groan with a ponderous load. Muffled sounds of possible vocal origin approached, and at length a firm knock came at my outer door. For a moment I simply held my breath and waited. Eternities seemed to elapse, and the nauseous, fishy odour of my environment seemed to mount suddenly and spectacularly. Then the knocking was repeated, continuously and with growing insistence. I knew that the time for action had come, and forthwith drew the bolt of the northward connecting door, bracing myself for the task of battering it open. The knocking waxed louder, and I hoped that its volume would cover the sound of my efforts. At last, beginning my attempt, I lunged again and again at the thin panelling with my left shoulder, heedless of shock or pain. The door resisted even more than I had expected, but I did not give in. And all the while the clamour at the outer door increased. Finally the connecting door gave, but with such a crash that I knew those outside must have heard. Instantly the outside knocking became a violent battering, while keys sounded ominously in the hall doors of the rooms on both sides of me. Rushing through the newly opened connection, I succeeded in bolting the northerly hall door before the lock could be turned, but even as I did so, I heard the hall door of the third room, the one from whose window I had hoped to reach the roof below, being tried with a pass key. For an instant, I felt absolute despair, since my trapping in a chamber with no window egress seemed complete. A wave of almost abnormal horror swept over me, and invested with a terrible but unexplainable singularity, the flashlight glimpsed dust prints made by the intruder who had lately tried my door from this room. Then, with a dazed automatism which persisted despite hopelessness, I made for the next connecting door and performed the blind motion of pushing at it in an effort to get through and, granting that fastenings might be as providentially intact as in this second room, bolt the hall door beyond before the lock could be turned from outside. Sheer fortunate chance gave me my reprieve, for the connecting door before me was not only unlocked, but actually ajar. In a second I was through, and had my right knee and shoulder against a hall door which was visibly opening inward. My pressure took the opener off guard, for the thing shut as I pushed, so that I could slip the well-conditioned bolt as I had done with the other door. As I gained this respite, I heard the battering at the two other doors abate, while a confused clatter came from the connecting door I had shielded with the bedstead. Evidently, the bulk of my assailants had entered the southerly room and were massing in a lateral attack. But at the same moment, a pass key sounded in the next door to the north, and I knew that a nearer peril was at hand. The northward connecting door was wide open, but there was no time to think about checking the already turning lock in the hall. 
All I could do was to shut and bolt the open connecting door, as well as its mate on the opposite side, pushing a bedstead against the one and a bureau against the other, and moving a washstand in front of the hall door. I must, I saw, trust to such makeshift barriers to shield me till I could get out the window and on the roof of the Payne Street block. But even in this acute moment, my chief horror was something apart from the immediate weakness of my defences. I was shuddering because not one of my pursuers, despite some hideous pantings, gruntings and subdued barkings at odd intervals, was uttering an unmuffled or intelligible vocal sound. As I moved the furniture and rushed toward the windows, I heard a frightful scurrying along the corridor toward the room north of me and perceived that the southward battering had ceased. Plainly, most of my opponents were about to concentrate against the feeble connecting door which they knew must open directly on me. Outside, the moon played on the ridgepole of the block below, and I saw that the jump would be desperately hazardous because of the steep surface on which I must land. Surveying the conditions, I chose the more southerly of the two windows as my avenue of escape, planning to land on the inner slope of the roof and make for the nearest skylight. Once inside one of the decrepit brick structures, I would have to reckon with pursuit, but I hoped to descend and dodge in and out of yawning doorways along the shadowed courtyard, eventually getting to Washington Street and slipping out of town toward the south. The clatter at the northerly connecting door was now terrific, and I saw that the weak panelling was beginning to splinter. Obviously, the besiegers had brought some ponderous object into play as a battering ram. The bedstead, however, still held firm, so that I had at least a faint chance of making good my escape. As I opened the window, I noticed that it was flanked by heavy vela draperies, suspended from a pole by brass rings and also that there was a large projecting catch for the shutters on the exterior. Seeing a possible means of avoiding the dangerous jump, I yanked at the hangings and brought them down, pole and all, then quickly hooking two of the rings in the shutter catch and flinging the drapery outside. The heavy folds reached fully to the abutting roof, and I saw that the rings and catch would be likely to bear my weight. So climbing out of the window and down the improvised rope ladder, I left behind me forever the morbid and horror-infested fabric of the Gilman house. I landed safely on the loose slates of the steep roof and succeeded in gaining the gaping black skylight without a slip. Glancing up at the window I had left, I observed it was still dark, though far across the crumbling chimneys to the north, I could see lights ominously blazing in the order of Dagon Hall, the Baptist Church, and the congregational church which I recalled so shiveringly. There had seemed to be no one in the courtyard below, and I hoped there would be a chance to get away before the spreading of a general alarm. Flashing my pocket lamp into the skylight, I saw that there were no steps down. The distance was slight, however, so I clambered over the brink and dropped, striking a dusty floor littered with crumbling boxes and barrels. The place was ghoulish-looking, but I was past minding such impressions and made at once for the staircase revealed by my flashlight after a hasty glance at my watch which shewed the hour to be 2 a.m. The steps creaked but seemed tolerably sound, and I raced down past a barn-like second story to the ground floor. The desolation was complete, and only echoes answered my footfalls. At length I reached the lower hall, at one end of which I saw a faint luminous rectangle marking the ruined Payne Street doorway. Heading the other way, I found the back door also open, and darted out and down five stone steps to the grass-grown cobblestones of the courtyard. The moonbeams did not reach down here, but I could just see my way about without using the flashlight. Some of the windows on the Gilman house side were faintly glowing, and I thought I heard confused sounds within. Walking softly over to the Washington Street side, I perceived several open doorways and chose the nearest as my route out. The hallway inside was black, and when I reached the opposite end, I saw that the street door was wedged immovably shut. Resolved to try another building, I groped my way back toward the courtyard, but stopped short when close to the doorway. For out of an open door in the Gilman house, a large crowd of doubtful shapes was pouring 
lanterns bobbing in the darkness, and horrible croaking voices exchanging low cries in what was certainly not English. The figures moved uncertainly, and I realised to my relief that they did not know where I had gone, but for all that they sent a shiver of horror through my frame. Their features were indistinguishable, but their crouching, shambling gait was abominably repellent. And worst of all, I perceived that one figure was strangely robed and unmistakably surmounted by a tall tiara of a design altogether too familiar. As the figures spread throughout the courtyard, I felt my fears increase. Suppose I could find no egress from this building on the street side. The fishy odour was detestable, and I wondered I could stand it without fainting. Again, groping toward the street, I opened a door off the hall and came upon an empty room with closely shuttered but sashless windows. Fumbling in the rays of my flashlight, I found I could open the shutters, and in another moment had climbed outside and was carefully closing the aperture in its original manner. I was now in Washington Street, and for the moment saw no living thing nor any light save that of the moon. From several directions in the distance, however, I could hear the sound of hoarse voices, of footsteps, and of a curious kind of pattering which did not sound quite like footsteps. Plainly, I had no time to lose. The points of the compass were clear to me, and I was glad that all the street lights were turned off, as is often the custom on strongly moonlit nights in unprosperous rural regions. Some of the sounds came from the south, yet I retained my design of escaping in that direction. There would, I knew, be plenty of deserted doorways to shelter me in case I met any person or group who looked like pursuers. I walked rapidly, softly, and close to the ruined houses. While hatless and dishevelled after my arduous climb, I did not look especially noticeable, and stood a good chance of passing unheeded if forced to encounter any casual wayfarer. At Bates Street, I drew into a yawning vestibule while two shambling figures crossed in front of me, but were soon on my way again and approaching the open space where Elliott Street obliquely crosses Washington at the intersection of South. Though I had never seen this space, it had looked dangerous to me on the grocery youth's map, since the moonlight would have free play there. There was no use trying to evade it, for any alternative course would involve detours of possibly disastrous visibility and delaying effect. The only thing to do was to cross it boldly and openly, imitating the typical shamble of the Innsmouth folk as best I could, and trusting that no one, or at least no pursuer of mine, would be there. Just how fully the pursuit was organised, and indeed just what its purpose might be, I could form no idea. There seemed to be unusual activity in the town, but I judged that the news of my escape from the Gilman had not yet spread. I would, of course, soon have to shift from Washington to some other southward street, for that party from the hotel would doubtless be after me. I must have left dust prints in that last old building, revealing how I had gained the street. The open space was, as I had expected, strongly moonlit, and I saw the remains of a park-like, iron-railed green in its centre. Fortunately, no one was about, though a curious sort of buzz or roar seemed to be increasing in the direction of Town Square. South Street was very wide, leading directly down a slight declivity to the waterfront and commanding a long view out at sea, and I hoped that no one would be glancing up it from afar as I crossed in the bright moonlight. My progress was unimpeded, and no fresh sound arose to hint that I had been spied. Glancing about me, I involuntarily let my pace slacken for a second to take in the sight of the sea, gorgeous in the burning moonlight at the street's end. Far out beyond the breakwater was the dim, dark line of Devil Reef, and as I glimpsed it, I could not help thinking of all the hideous legends I had heard in the last thirty-four hours legends which portrayed this ragged rock as a veritable gateway to realms of unfathomed horror and inconceivable abnormality. Then, without warning, I saw the intermittent flashes of light on the distant reef. They were definite and unmistakable, and awaked in my mind a blind horror beyond all rational proportion. My muscles tightened for panic flight, held in only by a certain unconscious caution and half-hypnotic fascination. And to make matters worse, 
there now flashed forth from the lofty cupola of the Gilman House, which loomed up to the northeast behind me, a series of analogous, though differently spaced gleams, which could be nothing less than an answering signal. Controlling my muscles, and realising afresh how plainly visible I was, I resumed my brisker and feignedly shambling pace, though keeping my eyes on that hellish and ominous reef as long as the opening of South Street gave me a seaward view. What the whole proceeding meant I could not imagine, unless it involved some strange rite connected with Devil Reef, or unless some party had landed from a ship on that sinister rock. I now bent to the left around the ruinous green, still gazing toward the ocean as it blazed in the spectral summer moonlight and watching the cryptical flashing of those nameless, unexplainable beacons. It was then that the most horrible impression of all was borne in upon me, the impression which destroyed my last vestige of self-control and set me running frantically southward past the yawning black doorways and fishily staring windows of that deserted nightmare street. For at a closer glance, I saw that the moonlit waters between the reef and the shore were far from empty. They were alive with a teeming horde of shapes swimming inward toward the town, and even at my vast distance, and in my single moment of perception, I could tell that the bobbing heads and flailing arms were alien and aberrant in a way scarcely to be expressed or consciously formulated. My frantic running ceased before I had covered a block, for at my left I began to hear something like the hue and cry of organised pursuit. There were footsteps and guttural sounds, and a rattling motor wheezed south along Federal Street. In a second, all my plans were utterly changed, for if the southward highway were blocked ahead of me, I must clearly find another egress from Innsmouth. I paused and drew into a gaping doorway, reflecting how lucky I was to have left the moonlit open space before these pursuers came down the parallel street. A second reflection was less comforting. Since the pursuit was down another street, it was plain that the party was not following me directly. It had not seen me, but was simply obeying a general plan of cutting off my escape. This, however, implied that all roads leading out of Innsmouth were similarly patrolled, for the denizens could not have known what route I intended to take. If this were so, I would have to make my retreat across country away from any road, but how could I do that in view of the marshy and creek-riddled nature of all the surrounding region? For a moment my brain reeled, both from sheer hopelessness and from a rapid increase in the omnipresent fishy odour. Then I thought of the abandoned railway to Rowley, whose solid line of ballasted, weed-grown earth still stretched off to the northwest from the crumbling station on the edge of the river gorge. There was just a chance that the townsfolk would not think of that, since its briar-choked desertion made it half impassable and the unlikeliest of all avenues for a fugitive to choose. I had seen it clearly from my hotel window and knew about how it lay. Most of its earlier length was uncomfortably visible from the Rowley Road and from high places in the town itself, but one could perhaps crawl inconspicuously through the undergrowth. At any rate, it would form my only chance of deliverance, and there was nothing to do but try it. Drawing inside the hall of my deserted shelter, I once more consulted the grocery boy's map with the aid of the flashlight. The immediate problem was how to reach the ancient railway, and I now saw that the safest course was ahead to Babson Street, then west to Lafayette, their edging around but not crossing an open space homologous to the one I had traversed, and subsequently back northward and westward in a zigzagging line through Lafayette, Bates, Adams and Bank Streets, the latter skirting the river gorge to the abandoned and dilapidated station I had seen from my window. My reason for going ahead to Babson was that I wished neither to recross the earlier open space nor to begin my westward course along a cross street as broad as south. Starting once more, I crossed the street to the right-hand side in order to edge around into Babson as inconspicuously as possible. Noises still continued in Federal Street, and as I glanced behind me, I thought I saw a gleam of light near the building through which I had escaped. Anxious to leave Washington Street, I broke into a quiet dog trot, trusting to luck not to encounter any observing eye. Next, the corner of Babson Street, I saw to my alarm that one of the houses was still inhabited, as attested by curtains at the window, 
but there were no lights within, and I passed it without disaster. In Babson Street, which crossed Federal and might thus reveal me to the searchers, I clung as closely as possible to the sagging, uneven buildings, twice pausing in a doorway as the noises behind me momentarily increased. The open space ahead shone wide and desolate under the moon, but my route would not force me to cross it. During my second pause, I began to detect a fresh distribution of the vague sounds, and upon looking cautiously out from cover, beheld a motor car darting across the open space, bound outward along Elliot Street, which there intersects both Babson and Lafayette. As I watched, choked by a sudden rise in the fishy odour after a short abatement, I saw a band of uncouth, crouching shapes loping and shambling in the same direction, and knew that this must be the party guarding the Ipswich Road, since that highway forms an extension of Elliot Street. Two of the figures I glimpsed were in voluminous robes, and one wore a peak diadem which glistened whitely in the moonlight. The gait of this figure was so odd that it sent a chill through me, for it seemed to me the creature was almost hopping. When the last of the band was out of sight, I resumed my progress, darting around the corner into Lafayette Street and crossing Elliot very hurriedly, lest stragglers of the party be still advancing along that thoroughfare. I did hear some croaking and clattering sounds far off toward Town Square, but accomplished the passage without disaster. My greatest dread was in recrossing broad and moonlit South Street with its seaward view, and I had to nerve myself for the ordeal. Someone might easily be looking, and possible Elliot Street stragglers could not fail to glimpse me from either of two points. At the last moment, I decided I had better slacken my trot and make the crossing as before in the shambling gait of an average Innsmouth native. When the view of the water again opened out, this time on my right, I was half determined not to look at it at all. I could not, however, resist but cast a sidelong glance as I carefully and imitatively shambled toward the protecting shadows ahead. There was no ship visible, as I had half expected there would be. Instead, the first thing which caught my eye was a small rowboat pulling in toward the abandoned wharves and laden with some bulky, tarpaulin-covered object. Its rowers, though distantly and indistinctly seen, were of an especially repellent aspect. Several swimmers were still discernible, while on the far black reef I could see a faint, steady glow, unlike the winking beacon visible before, and of a curious colour which I could not precisely identify. Above the slant roofs ahead, and to the right, there loomed the tall cupola of the Gilman house, but it was completely dark. The fishy odour, dispelled for a moment by some merciful breeze, now closed in again with maddening intensity. I had not quite crossed the street when I heard a muttering band advancing along Washington from the north. As they reached the broad, open space where I had had my first disquieting glimpse of the moonlit water, I could see them plainly only a block away, and was horrified by the bestial abnormality of their faces and the dog-like subhumanness of their crouching gait. One man moved in a positively simian way, with long arms frequently touching the ground while another figure, robed and tiara seemed to progress in an almost hopping fashion. I judged this party to be the one I had seen in the Gilman's courtyard, the one therefore most closely on my trail. As some of the figures turned to look in my direction, I was transfixed with fright, yet managed to preserve the casual, shambling gait I had assumed. To this day, I do not know whether they saw me or not. If they did, my stratagem must have deceived them, for they passed on across the moonlit space without varying their course, meanwhile croaking and jabbering in some hateful guttural patois I could not identify. Once more in shadow, I resumed my former dog-trot past the leaning and decrepit houses that stared blankly into the night. Having crossed to the western sidewalk, I rounded the nearest corner into Bait Street, where I kept close to the buildings on the southern side. I passed two houses, shewing signs of habitation, one of which had faint lights in upper rooms, yet met with no obstacle. As I turned into Adam Street, I felt measurably safer, but received a shock when a man reeled out of a black doorway directly in front of me. He proved, however, too hopelessly drunk to be a menace, 
so that I reached the dismal ruins of the Bank Street warehouses in safety. No one was stirring in that dead street beside the river gorge, and the roar of the waterfalls quite drowned my footsteps. It was a long dog trot to the ruined station, and the great brick warehouse walls around me seemed somehow more terrifying than the fronts of private houses. At last I saw the ancient arcaded station, or what was left of it, and made directly for the tracks that started from its farther end. The rails were rusty but mainly intact, and not more than half the ties had rotted away. Walking or running on such a surface was very difficult, but I did my best, and on the whole made very fair time. For some distance the line kept on along the gorge's brink, but at length I reached the long, covered bridge where it crossed the chasm at a dizzy height. The condition of this bridge would determine my next step. If humanly possible, I would use it. If not, I would have to risk more street wandering and take the nearest intact highway bridge. The vast, barn-like length of the old bridge gleamed spectrally in the moonlight, and I saw that the ties were safe for at least a few feet within. Entering, I began to use my flashlight, and was almost knocked down by the cloud of bats that flapped past me. About halfway across there was a perilous gap in the ties, which I feared for a moment would halt me. But in the end, I risked a desperate jump which fortunately succeeded. I was glad to see the moonlight again when I emerged from that macabre tunnel. The old tracks crossed River Street at grade, and at once veered off into a region increasingly rural and with less and less of Innsmouth's abhorrent fishy odour. Here the dense growth of weeds and briars hindered me and cruelly tore my clothes, but I was none the less glad that they were there to give me concealment in case of peril. I knew that much of my route must be visible from the Rowley Road. The marshy region began very shortly, with the single track on a low, grassy embankment where the weedy growth was somewhat thinner. Then came a sort of island of higher ground, where the line passed through a shallow, open cut, choked with bushes and brambles. I was very glad of this partial shelter, since at this point the Rowley Road was uncomfortably near according to my window view. At the end of the cut it would cross the track and swerve off to a safer distance, but meanwhile I must be exceedingly careful. I was by this time thankfully certain that the railway itself was not patrolled. Just before entering the cut, I glanced behind me, but saw no pursuer. The ancient spires and roofs of decaying Innsmouth gleamed lovely and ethereal in the magic yellow moonlight, and I thought of how they must have looked in the old days before the shadow fell. Then, as my gaze circled inland from the town, something less tranquil arrested my notice and held me immobile for a second. What I saw, or fancied I saw, was a disturbing suggestion of undulant motion far to the south, a suggestion which made me conclude that a very large horde must be pouring out of the city along the level Ipswich Road. The distance was great, and I could distinguish nothing in detail, but I did not at all like the look of that moving column. It undulated too much and glistened too brightly in the rays of the now westering moon. There was a suggestion of sound, too, though the wind was blowing the other way, a suggestion of bestial scraping and bellowing even worse than the muttering of the parties I had lately overheard. All sorts of unpleasant conjectures crossed my mind. I thought of those very extreme Innsmouth types said to be hidden in crumbling, centuried warrens near the waterfront. I thought, too, of those nameless swimmers I had seen, Counting the parties so far glimpsed, as well as those presumably covering other roads, the number of my pursuers must be strangely large for a town as depopulated as Innsmouth. Whence could come the dense personnel of such a column as I now beheld? Did those ancient, unplumbed warrens teem with a twisted, uncatalogued, and unsuspected life? Or had some unseen ship indeed landed a legion of unknown outsiders on that hellish reef? Who were they? Why were they there? And if such a column of them was scouring the Ipswich Road, would the patrols on the other roads be likewise augmented? I had entered the brush-grown cut and was struggling along at a very slow pace when that damnable fishy odour again waxed dominant. 
had the wind suddenly changed eastward so that it blew in from the sea and over the town. It must have, I concluded, since I now began to hear shocking guttural murmurs from that hitherto silent direction. There was another sound, too, a kind of wholesale, colossal flopping or pattering which somehow called up images of the most detestable sort. It made me think illogically of that unpleasantly undulating column on the far-off Ipswich Road. And then both stench and sounds grew stronger, so that I paused, shivering and grateful for the cut's protection. It was here, I recalled, that the Rowley Road drew so close to the old railway before crossing westward and diverging. Something was coming along that road, and I must lie low till its passage and vanishment in the distance. Thank heaven these creatures employed no dogs for tracking, though perhaps that would have been impossible amidst the omnipresent regional odour. Crouched in the bushes of that sandy cleft, I felt reasonably safe, even though I knew the searchers would have to cross the track in front of me not much more than a hundred yards away. I would be able to see them, but they could not, except by a malign miracle, see me. All at once, I began dreading to look at them as they passed. I saw the close, moonlit space where they would surge by and had curious thoughts about the irredeemable pollution of that space. They would perhaps be the worst of all Innsmouth types, something one would not care to remember. The stench waxed overpowering and the noises swelled to a bestial babel of croaking, baying and barking without the least suggestion of human speech. Were these indeed the voices of my pursuers? Did they have dogs after all? So far, I had seen none of the lower animals in Innsmouth. That flopping or pattering was monstrous. I could not look upon the degenerate creatures responsible for it. I would keep my eyes shut till the sounds receded toward the west. The horde was very close now, the air foul with their hoarse snarlings, and the ground almost shaking with their alien-rhythmed footfalls. My breath nearly ceased to come, and I put every ounce of willpower into the task of holding my eyelids down. I am not even yet willing to say whether what followed was a hideous actuality or only a nightmare hallucination. The later action of the government, after my frantic appeals, would tend to confirm it as a monstrous truth. But could not an hallucination have been repeated under the quasi-hypnotic spell of that ancient, haunted and shadowed town? Such places have strange properties, and the legacy of insane legend might well have acted on more than one human imagination amidst those dead, stench-cursed streets and huddles of rotting roofs and crumbling steeples. Is it not possible that the germ of an actual contagious madness lurks in the depths of that shadow over Innsmouth? Who can be sure of reality after hearing things like the tale of old Zadok Allen? The government men never found poor Zadok and have no conjectures to make as to what became of him. Where does madness leave off and reality begin? Is it possible that even my latest fear is sheer delusion? But I must try to tell what I thought I saw that night under the mocking yellow moon, saw surging and hopping down the Rowley Road in plain sight in front of me as I crouched among the wild brambles of that desolate railway cut. Of course, my resolution to keep my eyes shut had failed. It was foredoomed to failure, for who could crouch blindly while a legion of croaking, baying entities of unknown source flopped noisomely past, scarcely more than a hundred yards away? I thought I was prepared for the worst, and I really ought to have been prepared considering what I had seen before. My other pursuers had been accursedly abnormal, so should I not have been ready to face a strengthening of the abnormal element? to look upon forms in which there was no mixture of the normal at all. I did not open my eyes until the raucous clamour came loudly from a point obviously straight ahead. Then I knew that a long section of them must be plainly in sight where the sides of the cut flattened out and the road crossed the track, and I could no longer keep myself from sampling whatever horror that leering yellow moon might have to shew. It was the end for whatever remains to me of life on the surface of this earth, of every vestige of mental peace and confidence in the integrity of nature and of the human mind, nothing that I could have imagined, nothing 
even that I could have gathered had I credited old Zadok's crazy tale in the most literal way, would be in any way comparable to the demoniac, blasphemous reality that I saw, or believe I saw. I have tried to hint what it was in order to postpone the horror of writing it down boldly. Can it be possible that this planet has actually spawned such things, that human eyes have truly seen, as objective flesh, what man has hitherto known only in febrile fantasy and tenuous legend? And yet I saw them in a limitless stream, flopping, hopping, croaking, bleating, surging inhumanly through the spectral moonlight in a grotesque, malignant saraband of fantastic nightmare and some of them had tall tiaras of that nameless whitish gold metal, and some were strangely robed, and one who led the way was clad in a ghoulishly humped black coat and striped trousers, and had a man's felt hat perched on the shapeless thing that answered for a head. I think their predominant colour was a greyish green, though they had white bellies. They were mostly shiny and slippery, but the ridges of their backs were scaly. Their forms vaguely suggested the anthropoid, while their heads were the heads of fish, with prodigious bulging eyes that never closed. At the sides of their necks were palpitating gills, and their long paws were webbed. They hopped irregularly, sometimes on two legs and sometimes on four. I was somehow glad that they had no more than four limbs. Their croaking, baying voices, clearly used for articulate speech, held all the dark shades of expression which their staring faces lacked. But for all of their monstrousness, they were not unfamiliar to me. I knew too well what they must be. For was not the memory of that evil tiara at Newburyport still fresh? They were the blasphemous fish frogs of the nameless design, living and horrible. And as I saw them, I knew also of what that humped, tiarid priest in the black church basement had so fearsomely reminded me. Their number was past guessing. It seemed to me that there were limitless swarms of them, and certainly my momentary glimpse could have shown only the least fraction. In another instant, everything was blotted out by a merciful fit of fainting, the first I had ever had. It was a gentle daylight rain that awaked me from my stupor in the brush-grown railway cut, and when I staggered out to the roadway ahead, I saw no trace of any prints in the fresh mud. The fishy odour, too, was gone. Innsmouth's ruined roofs and toppling steeples loomed up greyly toward the southeast, but not a living creature did I spy in all the desolate salt marshes around. My watch was still going, and told me that the hour was past noon. The reality of what I had been through was highly uncertain in my mind, but I felt that something hideous lay in the background. I must get away from evil-shadowed Innsmouth, and accordingly I began to test my cramped, wearied powers of locomotion. Despite weakness, hunger, horror and bewilderment, I found myself after a long time able to walk, so started slowly along the muddy road to Rowley. Before evening I was in the village, getting a meal and providing myself with presentable clothes. I caught the night train to Arkham, and the next day talked long and earnestly with government officials there, a process I later repeated in Boston. With the main result of these colloquies, the public is now familiar, and I wish, for normality's sake, there were nothing more to tell. Perhaps it is madness that is overtaking me, yet perhaps a greater horror, or a greater marvel, is reaching out. As may well be imagined, I gave up most of the foreplanned features of the rest of my tour, the scenic, architectural and antiquarian diversions on which I had counted so heavily. Nor did I dare look for that piece of strange jewellery said to be in the Miskatonic University Museum. I did, however, improve my stay in Arkham by collecting some genealogical notes I had long wished to possess, very rough and hasty data, it is true, but capable of good use later on when I might have time to collate and codify them. The curator of the historical society there, Mr. E. Lapham Peabody, was very courteous about assisting me, and expressed unusual interest when I told him I was a grandson of Eliza Orne of Arkham, who was born in 1867 and had married James Williamson of Ohio at the age of 17. It seemed that a maternal uncle of mine had been there many years before on a quest much like my own, 
and that my grandmother's family was a topic of some local curiosity. There had, Mr. Peabody said, been considerable discussion about the marriage of her father, Benjamin Orne, just after the Civil War, since the ancestry of the bride was peculiarly puzzling. That bride was understood to have been an orphaned marsh of New Hampshire, a cousin of the Essex County marshes, but her education had been in France and she knew very little of her family. A guardian had deposited funds in a Boston bank to maintain her and her French governess, but the guardian's name was unfamiliar to Arkham people, and in time he dropped out of sight so that the governess assumed his role by court appointment. The French woman, now long dead, was very taciturn, and there were those who said she could have told more than she did. But the most baffling thing was the inability of anyone to place the recorded parents of the young woman, Enoch and Lydia Messerve Marsh, among the known families of New Hampshire. Possibly, many suggested, she was the natural daughter of some Marsh of prominence. She certainly had the true Marsh eyes. Most of the puzzling was done after her early death, which took place at the birth of my grandmother, her only child. Having formed some disagreeable impressions connected with the name of Marsh, I did not welcome the news that it belonged on my own ancestral tree, nor was I pleased by Mr. Peabody's suggestion that I had the true Marsh eyes myself. However, I was grateful for data which I knew would prove valuable, and took copious notes and lists of book references regarding the well-documented Orne family. I went directly home to Toledo from Boston and later spent a month at Maumee recuperating from my ordeal. In September, I entered Oberlin for my final year and from then till the next June was busy with studies and other wholesome activities, reminded of the bygone terror only by occasional official visits from government men in connection with the campaign which my pleas and evidence had started. Around the middle of July, just a year after the Innsmouth experience, I spent a week with my late mother's family in Cleveland, checking some of my new genealogical data with the various notes, traditions and bits of heirloom material in existence there, and seeing what kind of connected chart I could construct. I did not exactly relish the task, for the atmosphere of the Williamson home had always depressed me. There was a strain of morbidity there, and my mother had never encouraged my visiting her parents as a child, although she always welcomed her father when he came to Toledo. My Arkham-born grandmother had seemed strange and almost terrifying to me, and I do not think I grieved when she disappeared. I was eight years old then, and it was said that she had wandered off in grief after the suicide of my uncle Douglas, her eldest son. He had shot himself after a trip to New England, the same trip, no doubt, which had caused him to be recalled at the Arkham Historical Society. This uncle had resembled her, and I had never liked him either. Something about the staring, unwinking expression of both of them had given me a vague, unaccountable uneasiness. My mother and Uncle Walter had not looked like that. They were like their father, though poor little cousin Lawrence, Walter's son, had been an almost perfect duplicate of his grandmother before his condition took him to the permanent seclusion of a sanitarium at Canton. I had not seen him in four years, but my uncle once implied that his state, both mental and physical, was very bad. This worry had probably been a major cause of his mother's death two years before. My grandfather and his widowed son, Walter, now comprised the Cleveland household, but the memory of older times hung thickly over it. I still disliked the place and tried to get my researches done as quickly as possible. Williamson records and traditions were supplied in abundance by my grandfather, though for Orn material I had to depend on my uncle Walter, who put at my disposal the contents of all his files, including notes, letters, cuttings, heirlooms, photographs and miniatures. It was in going over the letters and pictures on the Orn side that I began to acquire a kind of terror of my own ancestry. As I have said, my grandmother and Uncle Douglas had always disturbed me. Now, years after their passing, I gazed at their pictured faces with a measurably heightened feeling of repulsion and alienation.
I could not at first understand the change, but gradually a horrible sort of comparison began to obtrude itself on my unconscious mind, despite the steady refusal of my consciousness to admit even the least suspicion of it. It was clear that the typical expression of these faces now suggested something it had not suggested before, something which would bring stark panic if too openly thought of. But the worst shock came when my uncle shooed me the Orn jewellery in a downtown safe deposit vault. Some of the items were delicate and inspiring enough, but there was one box of strange old pieces descended from my mysterious great-grandmother which my uncle was almost reluctant to produce. They were, he said, a very grotesque and almost repulsive design, and had never to his knowledge been publicly worn, though my grandmother used to enjoy looking at them. Vague legends of bad luck clustered around them, and my great-grandmother's French governess had said they ought not to be worn in New England, though it would be quite safe to wear them in Europe. As my uncle began slowly and grudgingly to unwrap the things he urged me not to be shocked by the strangeness and frequent hideousness of the designs, artists and archaeologists who had seen them pronounced the workmanship superlatively and exotically exquisite, though no one seemed able to define their exact material or assign them to any specific art tradition. There were two armlets, a tiara, and a kind of pectoral, the latter having in high relief certain figures of almost unbearable extravagance. During this description I had kept a tight rein on my emotions, but my face must have betrayed my mounting fears. My uncle looked concerned and paused in his unwrapping to study my countenance. I motioned to him to continue, which he did with renewed signs of reluctance. He seemed to expect some demonstration when the first piece, the tiara, became visible, but I doubt if he expected quite what actually happened. I did not expect it either, for I thought I was thoroughly forewarned regarding what the jewellery would turn out to be. What I did was to faint silently away, just as I had done in that briar-choked railway cut a year before. From that day on, my life has been a nightmare of brooding and apprehension, nor do I know how much is hideous truth and how much madness. My great-grandmother had been a marsh of unknown source whose husband lived in Arkham, and did not old Zadok say that the daughter of Obed Marsh by a monstrous mother was married to an Arkham man through a trick? What was it the ancient toper had muttered about the likeness of my eyes to Captain Obed's? In Arkham, too, the curator had told me I had the true Marsh eyes. Was Obed Marsh my own great-great-grandfather? Who or what? Then was my great-great-grandmother. But perhaps this was all madness. Those whitish gold ornaments might easily have been bought from some Innsmouth sailor by the father of my great-grandmother, whoever he was. And that look in the staring-eyed faces of my grandmother and self-slain uncle might be sheer fancy on my part. Sheer fancy, bolstered up by the Innsmouth shadow which had so darkly coloured my imagination. But why had my uncle killed himself after an ancestral quest in New England? For more than two years I fought off these reflections with partial success. My father secured me a place in an insurance office, and I buried myself in routine as deeply as possible. In the winter of 1930-31, however, the dreams began. They were very sparse and insidious at first, but increased in frequency and vividness as the weeks went by. Great watery spaces opened out before me, and I seemed to wander through titanic sunken porticos and labyrinths of weedy cyclopean walls with grotesque fishes as my companions. Then the other shapes began to appear, filling me with nameless horror the moment I awoke. But during the dreams they did not horrify me at all. I was one with them wearing their unhuman trappings, treading their aqueous ways, and praying monstrously at their evil sea-bottom temples. There was much more than I could remember, but even what I did remember each morning would be enough to stamp me as a madman or a genius if ever I dared write it down. Some frightful influence, I felt, was seeking gradually to drag me out of the sane world of wholesome life into unnameable abysses of blackness and alienage and the process told heavily on me. My health and appearance grew steadily worse, 
till finally I was forced to give up my position and adopt the static, secluded life of an invalid. Some odd nervous affliction had me in its grip, and I found myself at times almost unable to shut my eyes. It was then that I began to study the mirror with mounting alarm. The slow ravages of disease are not pleasant to watch, but in my case, there was something subtler and more puzzling in the background. My father seemed to notice it too, for he began looking at me curiously and almost affrightedly. What was taking place in me? Could it be that I was coming to resemble my grandmother and Uncle Douglas? One night, I had a frightful dream in which I met my grandmother under the sea. She lived in a phosphorescent palace of many terraces, with gardens of strange, leprous corals and grotesque brachiate efflorescences, and welcomed me with a warmth that may have been sardonic. She had changed, as those who take to the water change, and told me she had never died. Instead, she had gone to a spot her dead son had learned about, and had leaped to a realm whose wonders, destined for him as well, he had spurned with a smoking pistol. This was to be my realm too, I could not escape it. I would never die, but would live with those who had lived since before man ever walked the earth. I met also that which had been her grandmother. For eighty thousand years Perthia Lee had lived in Yahanthli, and thither she had gone back after Obed Marsh was dead. Yahanthli was not destroyed when the upper earth men shot death into the sea. It was hurt, but not destroyed. The deep ones could never be destroyed, even though the Paleogean magic of the forgotten old ones might sometimes check them. For the present, they would rest. But some day, if they remembered, they would rise again for the tribute great Cthulhu craved. It would be a city greater than Innsmouth next time. They had planned to spread, and had brought up that which would help them, but now they must wait once more. For bringing the upper earth men's death, I must do a penance but that would not be heavy. This was the dream in which I saw a Shoggoth for the first time, and the sight set me awake in a frenzy of screaming. That morning, the mirror definitely told me I had acquired the Innsmouth look. So far, I have not shot myself as my Uncle Douglas did. I bought an automatic and almost took the step, but certain dreams deterred me. The tense extremes of horror are lessening, and I feel queerly drawn toward the unknown sea deeps instead of fearing them. I hear and do strange things in sleep, and awake with a kind of exultation instead of terror. I do not believe I need to wait for the full change as most have waited. If I did, my father would probably shut me up in a sanitarium as my poor little cousin is shut up. Stupendous and unheard of splendors await me below, and I shall seek them soon. Ear Cthulhu Ftagen, ear, ear. No, I shall not shoot myself. I cannot be made to shoot myself. I shall plan my cousin's escape from that Canton madhouse, and together we shall go to marvel shadowed Innsmouth. We shall swim out to that brooding reef in the sea and dive down through black abysses to Cyclopean and many columned Yahanthli, and in that lair of the deep ones we shall dwell amidst wonder and glory forever.